I would like to call this uh, hearing to order this morning and uh, certainly want to welcome our panel of witnesses and uh, also want to welcome all the members back on the subcommittee. I look forward to another two years with the ranking member, um, Mr. Rush. And also, we're really excited to have three new members on the Republican side uh, joining our subcommittee for the first time, uh, Mr. Latta of Ohio and Mr. Cassidy of Louisiana and also Mr. Kinsinger of Illinois. We are delighted that they're on this subcommittee and look forward to working with them on important issues facing our nation in the energy sector as well as all of the members of the subcommittee, Democrat and Republican. The title of today's hearing uh, is American Energy Security and Innovation, and we're going to focus on an assessment of North America's uh, energy resources. I think all of us agree that we have many problems uh, facing our country today, but one of the primary ones that we have is a sluggish economy, and we want to be sure that we take every action possible to stimulate the economy and create more jobs. Uh, certainly, we are very much aware in the last quarter our GDP uh, decreased by 0.1 percent. Uh, our unemployment rate has ticked up from 7.8 to 7.9 percent. And so we all face this challenge of adopting policies and taking actions that can help uh, stimulate the economy. Certainly one of the primary factors that affects the economy is energy uh, policy. And uh, certainly there are other factors as well, but that plays a vital role. I was reminded as I read the testimony last night that it wasn't too many years ago when people throughout the country, experts and otherwise, were talking about how uh, the U.S. Uh, fossil fuels, for example, uh, their resources were being depleted. Uh, we were running out of oil, we were running out of natural gas, and we're going to have to be uh, importing more. As a matter of fact, uh, in January 2007, a CEO of one of our largest utility companies made the comment that, uh, that we were running out of natural gas, production was declining and demand growing, so he expected that imports would go from 3% of our national uh, needs uh, to 24% in 2020. And then, of course, we know what has happened. Uh, we've had all sorts of new discoveries, the Bakken Field, the Eagle Ford uh, developments in Colorado. And uh, most of these shale fields have uh, been discovered on private lands. And even though the number of permits on public lands has gone down, uh, the production on private lands has increased uh, dramatically. So this is a real game changer, the possibility of a game changer in America. We've heard the term for many, many years, we have that opportunity to be energy independent. And that is actually the reality today. And I'll tell you what, people around the world are focused on it, too, because we, some of our witnesses today attended the World Economic Forum in Davos, and we know that many uh, the Europeans are expressing great concern about the abundance of energy that we have in America and their ability to compete in the global marketplace because their energy costs are going up in Europe. And we have the opportunity to decrease our energy cost because of this abundance of fossil fuel that we have. Now we all recognize that we have uh, renewables that can play a role as well. But I'm not going to be an alarmist about the increased use of fossil fuel because we, our carbon dioxide emissions today are lower than they've been in America in 20 years, which shows that the marketplace can continue to play a vital role. Our expertise in technology continues to improve. And so uh, in oil, in natural gas, and in coal, we have abundant resources that can meet the needs of this country on the electricity side and the transportation side for years and years to come. 
so we have a unique opportunity, and the policies that we adopt at the government level will determine whether or not we're going to be successful in America. And uh, some of the policies, uh, there's a lot of disagreement on this committee about how aggressive EPA should be. Uh, I was reading some court decisions over the last uh, a couple of uh, weeks. Uh, there were a total of uh, eight of them in which the court language was very strong in chastising EPA for being overly aggressive and exceeding their legal authority. And yet, uh, they have had good policies as well, and America does not have to take a back seat to anyone, to any country, for our enforcement of environmental laws. But our objective is we want a balanced approach. We don't want to be an alarmist on climate change, for example, but we want to protect our environment, and we want to fully explore the natural resources that we have which can go a long way stimulating our economy and creating jobs for Americans. With that, at this time, I'd like to recognize the gentleman from Illinois, uh, Mr. Rush, for uh, five minutes. I certainly want to thank you, Mr. Chairman. And Mr. Chairman, uh, I also uh, want to join you in welcoming all the members of the new members of the subcommittee and those who are returning. And I want to especially uh, welcome the new members of, on the Democratic side Mr. McNerney, Mr. Tom Cole, Mr. Merrill, Ms. McSuey, and Ms. Christensen to uh, this subcommittee. Mr. Chairman, I want to thank you for holding uh, today's hearing assessing North America's energy resources. As we begin the subcommittee's work for the 113th Congress, I want, would submit that it is critical for us as policymakers to understand the changing landscape of our nation's energy supplies. Not only as we move away from policies guided by scarcity, but also so that we can develop a comprehensive energy plan for moving the, this nation forward. This subcommittee needs to get down to the serious business of enacting an energy blueprint that will move this country towards a truly all of the above strategy that will follow four basic principles. One, to provide safe, reliable, and affordable energy to all Americans. Two, to provide additional jobs and economic opportunity to all segments of our population. Three, a plan that will address the dire consequences of climate change that scientists have been warning us about for years now, and which we have been seeing more and more of firsthand evidence uh, and evidences across this nation. And fourth, to set a path that would help us become uh, self-sufficient and energy independent over the next few decades. Mr. Chairman, today we will hear from our expert witnesses that domestic crude oil production has increased significantly over the past few years, with the EIA reporting that U.S. crude oil production has increased from $5.1 million a million barrels per day in 2007 to 6.4 million barrels per day in 2012, the highest level since 1997. The EIA reports that in 2005, the U.S. imported 60% of the petroleum it consumed, and by 2012, that number had dropped to about 41%, the lowest level in decades. This decline can be attributed primarily to increased domestic oil production, the additional use of biofuels, as well as the adoption of higher fuel efficiency standards for vehicles. The IEA also projects that the U.S. will reduce its reliance on imported oil 
to less than 30% of consumption by 2035, and U.S. natural gas production will increase by 44% by 2040, due primarily to the projected growth in shale gas uh, production. However, Mr. Chairman, in order to reach all of the necessary objectives of providing reliable energy, creating new jobs, addressing climate change, and also becoming energy independent, it is imperative for this subcommittee to also promote and to encourage renewable energy resources. The NREL estimates that we can supply 80% of total U.S. electricity generation from renewable energy re generation through technologies that are commercially available by the year 2050. Mr. Chairman, I welcome today's hearing, and as we move legislatively, I would urge this subcommittee to promote a truly all-of-the-above energy policy that includes renewables and clean energy sources as well as traditional non, as traditional carbon intensive fossil fuels before the time, time is too late, Mr. Chairman, too late to act. We thank you and I really move, look forward to uh, hearing from today's witnesses and I yield back the balance of my time. Uh, thank you, Mr. Rush. We appreciate that opening statement. This time I recognize the chairman of the full committee, the gentleman from Michigan, uh, Mr. Upton, for five minutes. Well, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, certainly this hearing is a welcome one to examine the positive developments resulting from advancements in the innovation and technology, the game-changing potential for North American energy independence. What was once believed to be unthinkable is certainly now within our grasp. For 30 decades, 30 years, the American people have been told that we are a nation of declining resources at the mercy of OPEC. The story was nearly as gloomy with natural gas, with forecasts of dwindling domestic supplies, higher prices, rising imports from the Middle East. In fact, in this committee, many may remember when we crafted a new title in the Energy Policy Act of 2005 to facilitate what we thought would be the new norm, pending reliance on imported gas from geopolitically unstable regions of the world to add to our growing reliance on OPEC oil. What a bad thing. But thanks to the American ingenuity and advanced technologies, the trends in domestic oil and natural gas production have, in fact, been turned upside down. In fact, the U.S. is now the world's leading producer of natural gas, and the IEA is predicting that by 2020, U.S. oil production will exceed Saudi Arabia. 2020, let me repeat that, we're going to exceed the production in Saudi Arabia. Our overall energy landscape has changed dramatically in just a short period of time, and it is not only rewriting the economic outlook that we have as a nation, but also beginning to change the geopolitical nature of global energy economics. Today, this subcommittee is launching a series of hearings on energy security and innovation to hear from experts who are working with the current realities. It's up to us to ensure that our federal laws are not continuing to introduce roadblock after roadblock to enhance energy security. We've got to re remain steadfast in our support for efforts to improve the infrastructure necessary to maximize use of, the re of these resources, including the Keystone XL pipeline. These issues are too important for our nation to be looked at in a vacuum, and if we don't take advantage of our energy abundance, other nations are eagerly waiting to step in and use the North American energy to fuel their own growth. The benefits of emerging energy abundance are many, boosting our economy, creating jobs across the country, a bright spot in the economic downturn. We've got to build upon that progress. Once we have a more accurate sense of North America's energy potential, we can start the process of ensuring that we have a proper vision for the future. And I yield the balance of my time to anybody? Mr. Bart. Well, thank you, Mr. Chairman. I want the record to show that I have my iPad, and I am trying to do this electronically. So I'm at least trying. Uh, I want to welcome our witnesses. Uh, I see former Congressman Martin Frost out in the audience. Uh, he knows a little bit about energy. We're glad to have you here, Martin. 
Uh, today's an important hearing, Mr. Chairman. Uh, I represent a um, congressional district in Texas that at one time, had it been a nation, would have been the uh, fifth largest oil producing nation in the world. Uh, the first oil field west of the Mississippi was discovered in my congressional district at Corsicana in 1895. Uh, as we speak today in the um, Barnett Shale, uh, which is not totally in my congressional district, there are over 16,000 producing natural gas wells, and last year they produced in the neighborhood of 2 trillion cubic feet of natural gas in that one field. Uh, with the miracle of hydraulic fracturing, uh, we have unleashed a uh, drilling and production revolution in this country, not only in natural gas, but now that technology uh, is being used in oil. And the state of North Dakota, which less than 10 years ago had uh, probably fewer than two or 300 oil wells, uh, is on track in that one state to produce over a million barrels of oil uh, in the very near future, possibly this year. We can be energy independent if we want to. It's not a question of, of can we. It's a question is it in our economic and political self-interest to do so. So today's hearing is an important hearing for the American people to see the energy abundance that our Lord blessed us with and then the policymakers in this room and in this state, in this city, uh, can decide what we want to do with it. With that, Mr. Chairman, uh, I yield back to you or any other person. Thank you, Mr. Barton. At this time, I'd like to recognize the ranking member of the full committee, uh, Mr. Waxman of California, for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I appreciate that we're holding this hearing on North America's energy resources. We're going to hear testimony about fossil and renewable energy uh, supplies in the United States, Canada, and Mexico. Uh, we are dramatically improving the efficiency of our use of oil, so we're using less of it. At the same time, we're, doing, we're producing more domestic oil, which means we're importing less oil from dangerous parts of the world. We're unlocking new resources of natural gas, which is helping to limit the use of polluting coal and to increase the competitiveness of our domestic industries. We've doubled our capacity to generate renewable electricity from wind and solar in just four years, which has cut our pollution and invigorated clean energy manufacturing. These are all positive developments. The question we must ask is whether we are on a sustainable course for the years to come. In his inaugural address, President Obama said that we must transition to a sustainable energy future. He said we must respond to climate change because to do otherwise would, quote, betray our children and future generations, end quote. As we debate our energy future, this committee has a choice. It's an energy choice and a climate policy choice, and ultimately it's a moral choice. The biggest energy challenge we face as a country is carbon pollution. We can't have a conversation about America's energy policy without also having a conversation about climate change. We have a rapidly diminishing window to, of time to act to reduce our carbon pollution before the catastrophic impacts of climate change are irreversible. In November, the International Energy Agency published its World Energy Outlook. IEA concluded that our current global energy system is, quote, unsustainable, end quote. The International Energy Agency found that, quote, the climate goal of limiting warming to two degrees Celsius is becoming more difficult and more costly with each year that passes, end quote. The International Energy Agency also concluded that if the world does not take action to reduce carbon pollution before 2017, then all of the allowable CO2 emissions would be locked in by energy infrastructure existing at that time. That means that the energy policy decisions we make today will have a real and direct impact on whether we can limit climate change in the future. Every decision to build a new fossil fuel powered, fossil fuel fired power plant or construct a pipeline to transport tar sands or drill for more oil off our nation's coasts has climate risks. 
We need to understand and weigh those risks before we lock in infrastructure that will reduce carbon pollution for decades to come. There is an appeal to the energy resources we are discovering. We are stronger when we produce oil in the United States than when we import it from Saudi Arabia. We are better off when we produce our own natural gas than when we import LNG. But we also must recognize that the world has far more proven resources of oil, gas, and coal than we can ever safely use. The atmosphere has a rapidly shrinking capacity to safely absorb carbon. In fact, if we want to have a reasonable chance of limiting average global warming to 2 degrees centigrade or 3.6 degrees Fahrenheit, there is an estimated five times more carbon in, in proven fossil fuel reserves, reserves that we can release into the atmosphere. If we burn all the known reserves of fossil fuel without new technologies to sequester the carbon, the damage to the planet would be immense. The future will belong to the country that leads the inevitable transition to the clean energy economy of tomorrow. It is our responsibility to figure out how we uh, make sure our nation is in the forefront of this change. Uh, Mr. Chairman, this is a new Congress. I want to begin it by offering to work with you as we grapple with these incredibly serious challenges. I look forward to this hearing and future hearings on this subject and to our cooperation to deal with these uh, problems in a bipartisan and a balanced way. Thank you. You'll back the time. Uh, thank you, Mr. Waxman. We appreciate your opening statement. And I also uh, want to welcome Joe Pitts of Pennsylvania, uh, who's a new member of this uh, subcommittee. As many of you know, he's the chairman of the Health Subcommittee, and we're delighted to have him on the uh, Energy and Power Subcommittee as well. We do have a new vice chairman also, Steve Scalise, who was here, but I think stepped out for just a moment. Right now, I'd like to get to our witnesses. We are thrilled with the panel that we have today. Uh, each one of them are real experts in various fields and of energy. And we genuinely appreciate your testimony that you've prepared and that you're about to give. And I know that everyone will have uh, questions for you. And uh, at this time, I'd like to introduce our panel of witnesses. First, we have Adam Siminski, who's been here a number of times. He's the Administrator for the United States Information, Energy Information Administration, and we welcome you. Uh, Dr. Daniel Jurgen, who's Vice Chairman of IHS, and uh, many of you know Mr. Jurgen also because he wrote a book called The Prize, which won the Pulitzer Prize, so we're delighted that he's here. We have Jennifer Morgan, who is the Director of the Climate and Energy Program at the World Resources Institute. And we look forward to your testimony, Ms. Morgan. We have Mary Hutzler, who is a distinguished senior fellow at the Institute for Energy Research. Uh, I read her testimony as well, and she has some great things to tell us today. And then we have Mr. Harry Vitus, who's vice president for ICF International. And uh, we appreciate your thoughtful uh, testimony as well, Mr. Vitus. So, each one of you will be given five minutes uh, for your opening statement, and there are a couple of little boxes with lights, and when it is green, it means go, and when it's red, it means stop, but, uh, but we'll give you some leeway because uh, we do respect your being here and appreciate your expertise. So, Mr. Siminski, I'll recognize you for five minutes for your opening statement. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman and uh, members of the subcommittee. I appreciate the opportunity uh, to appear before you today to discuss American energy security and innovation. EIA is a statistical and analytical agency within the U.S. Department of Energy. By law, its data, analyses, and forecasts are independent of approval by any officer or employee of the U.S. government. My uh, statement today summarizes recent trends in production and uh, draws on EIA's January short-term energy outlook. Uh, and also, I'm going to talk about resource estimates for oil, gas, coal, and renewables for the United States. As I discuss the different sectors, though, it's useful to keep in mind that the methodologies for developing reserve and resource estimates differ across the fuels. 
EIA estimates that uh, U.S. total crude oil production averaged 6.4 million barrels a day in 2012, an increase of 8.8 million barrels a day, the largest actually since Colonel Drake drilled the first well, uh, commercial crude oil well up in Titusville, Pennsylvania, Mr. Pitts, back in 1859, uh, driven largely uh, by growth in tight oil production. Now, that's in figure one of my written statement, which is in the record. Uh, drilling in tight oil plays in North Dakota, Montana, and Texas are expected to account for the bulk of the forecast production growth over the next two years. U.S. crude oil production could reach 8 million barrels a day in 2014, uh, and uh, with some uh, very uh, strong assumptions about uh, how uh, drilling could proceed and other factors could get as high as 10 million barrels a day, uh, but that's not currently in our reference case. Uh, U.S. dry natural gas production has increased consistently since 2005, mainly because of production of shale gas resources. Total marketed production averaged about 69 billion cubic feet in 2012, and EIA expects uh, production will remain close to that level uh, this year and next year. Crude oil and natural gas proved reserve additions in 2010 were the highest recorded since EIA began publishing uh, those numbers in 1977. Crude oil approved reserves increased by 12.8%, uh, uh, almost 3 billion barrels during 2010 to end the year at over 25 billion barrels. U.S. approved reserves of wet natural gas increased by almost 12%, uh, 34 trillion cubic feet during 2010, ending that year at uh, well over 300 trillion cubic feet. Next, I want to speak to the issue of oil and natural gas resources. Estimates of technically recoverable resources, while inherently uncertain, are a common measure of the long-term viability of U.S. domestic uh, production. U.S. crude oil and lease condensate resources uh, in non-prohibited areas are estimated at 223 billion barrels in the annual energy outlook that we just published in December up from EIA's estimate of 140 billion barrels back in the year 2000. Uh, that is despite cumulative production since the year 2000 of over 26 billion barrels uh, of oil. U.S. total dry natural gas resources, uh, 2,327 trillion cubic feet in the uh, AEO 2013, are up from our 2000 estimate of nearly uh, 1,600, maybe I should say only 1,600 trillion cubic feet, despite cumulative production uh, between those years of 260 trillion cubic feet. The shale gas resource in the AEO 2013 is about 13 percent higher uh, than what we estimated in 2012. Moving on to coal, uh, domestic production increased, uh, decreased actually by 12 percent uh, by uh, over 1,000 million short tons between 2008 and 2012, half of this decline between 2011 and 12, uh, as uh, electric utilities and the industrial sector cut back their purchases. EIA estimates that coal consumption and electric power uh, in 2012 will total 829 million short tons, the lowest since 1992, due largely to competition from low natural gas prices. Coal exports in 2012, particularly partially offset uh, that uh, decline in consumption. The largest category of coal resources demonstrated a reserve base, which represents coal in the ground. Uh, this resource base was originally estimated back in 1974 by the Bureau of Mines as part of the last comprehensive assessment that they made. Uh, in January uh, 1 of 2012, the resource base was estimated to contain 483 billion short tons. That's a huge amount. Uh, limited resources at EIA uh, have prevented us from doing a full national assessment, uh, but we have updated some of the regions. Finally, I'd like to uh, highlight developments in renewable uh, resources. EIA estimates the production of renewables, uh, most renewables, grew significantly in 2012, especially wind and solar. Hydropower production fell uh, because of the drought. Even so, the overall growth in renewable energy consumption from 2010 to 2012 was over 10 percent. Uh, drought in the Midwest caused fuel ethanol uh, production to fall by about 80,000 barrels a day. In the second half of 2012, uh, we expect uh, that production will pick back up again uh, as the drought recedes, and we'll get back to pre-drought levels of about 870,000 barrels a day of ethanol production. 
Uh, biodiesel production averaged a billion gallons in 2012 and is expected to rise to meet the RFS requirements of 1.28 billion gallons that have been set for 2013. Uh, that concludes uh, my testimony. Thank you again, uh, Mr. Chairman, uh, for the opportunity to be here. Well, thank you. And uh, Dr. Jurgen, you were recognized for five minutes. Uh, Chairman Whitfield, uh, Ranking Member Rush, uh, members of the committee, I'm very pleased to be here. Uh, is your microphone on? So I'll start over with five minutes. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Chairman Whitfield, Ranking Member Rush, members of the committee, it's really an honor to be here and to have the chance to uh, share some thinking that fits into the framework of the discussion that the members have already laid out. Uh, it is indeed very timely because the United States is in the midst of an unconventional revolution in oil and gas that fits that all of the above strategy that Congressman Rush talked about and also becomes increasingly apparent, goes beyond energy itself. That is, it goes to the economy. And it's only become really apparent in the last year or two that this unconventional revolution is supporting currently about 1.7 million jobs in the United States. And it's not only in the oil and gas producing states. There are 44,000 jobs in New York, which doesn't produce 39,000 jobs in the state of Illinois. We think that overall job number will rise to 3 million by 2020. Last year, this unconventional revolution brought $62 billion in revenues to the federal and state government. By 2020, that number could be close to $115 billion. It is helping to stimulate a uh, manufacturing renaissance in the United States. We've noted something like $95 billion of plans for investment in the chemical sector in the United States. Don't know if all of that will be get done, but that demonstrates it. It's certainly improving the competitive position of the United States in the world and beginning to affect global geopolitics. Uh, I think although great advance has been made in solar and wind, uh, I talk about them in the quest as a rebirth of renewables, those are really innovations from the last century. In terms of this century, what's happening in oil and gas is the biggest energy innovation so far of the 21st century. It has, unfol it has unfolded fast. Uh, those of you who participated in hearings in 2008 remember those dark, dire days when, uh, I think as Chairman Whitfield reminded, the world was going to run out of oil and the United States was going to run out of oil even more quickly. How that has changed. Shale gas now has gone from 2 percent of our supply to 37 percent of our supply. And what is really dramatic is what's happened on oil, which instead of continuing its long decline has increased dramatically by almost 39 percent since 2008. That increase is equivalent, because you say, well, what does that mean? It's equivalent to the entire output of Nigeria, the seventh largest oil exporting country in OPEC. It is equivalent, almost, almost equivalent, to Iran's total exports before sanctions went into place. Indeed, it is sober, sobering to consider that without with these technologies and the oil output that's resulted from them, the sanctions on Iran might well have failed. Uh, the environmental aspects have been touched on. U.S. carbon dioxide emissions from energy consumption are down 13 percent since 2007. Uh, I think in the discussion we might get to some of the uh, conclusions that we came to as the Deutsch Committee, the subcommittee of the Secretary of Energy Advisory Board set up at the behest of President Obama on managing the environmental issues around this. Uh, one thing we did come out of uh, that hearing is uh, a focus on the role of the states and, in particular, the activities of Stronger, the uh, collaborative organization of the states that seats to uh, collaborative benchmarking and standard setting. Let me come finally to um, something that is always contentious, which is imports and exports of oil and energy, which has been a major issue for the United States for about 70 years. Uh, until the last, uh, the end of the last decade, it seemed that the question was only how fast would oil uh, imports go up and how big would our imports of natural gas uh, become, as the chairman referred to in his remarks. Well, this unconventional revolution has sure turned that around. Uh, Mr. Rush has uh, cited the decline in our, our imports uh, over the last seven years or so forth, and this is the result both of surging production and greater efficiency. Moreover, the flow of imports has changed. Canada now supplies about 27 percent of our total. But what gets the most attention right now is the question of whether we're going to become an exporter of LNG, liquefied natural gas. And I think this needs to be looked at in terms of the overall U.S. supply 
and global competition. Our view, similar to others, is that the market in the U.S. is demand constrained, not su supply constrained. Many LNG projects have been announced. We think only a handful will be built, these $10 billion projects. The reason is both cost and scale of global competition. Currently already, before any of these get going, uh, uh, already about a third of, uh, equivalent to a third of total existing capacity, new projects are under construction or been committed. So the U.S. capacity will be coming into a market in which there will be new supplies from Australia, new sources such as offshore East Africa and Eastern Mediterranean, Canada. Just yesterday, Canada uh, approved a major uh, export project to Asia. Uh, finally, there's shale gas uh, development that will occur elsewhere. So these will all be uh, offsets. So let me just uh, add one other thing. I think for decades the United States has made the free flow of energy supplies what really one of the cornerstone principles of our foreign policy. It is a principle we've urged on many other nations. So to me at least it's puzzling how we can ask, say to a close ally like Japan, suffering energy shortages as a result of Fukushima, that on the one hand we want you to import less oil from Iran, yet on the other hand we don't want to consider new natural gas exports to Japan. So those are some thoughts for consideration on it. I'll just conclude by saying certainly expanded domestic supply will add resilience to shocks and add to our security cushion. Moreover, prudent uh, expansion of U.S. energy exports will actually add an additional dimension to U.S. influence in the world. However, there remains only one world oil market and a disruption anywhere will be a disruption anywhere. So anyway, altogether, this unconventional oil and gas revolution has already had a major impact in multiple dimensions. Its significance will continue to grow as it continues to unfold, and these opportunities certainly provide a timely opportunity for assessing the impact and significance in its many dimensions. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Jurgen. Uh, Ms. Morgan, you're recognized for five minutes. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman, and thank you for the opportunity to testify here today. Uh, I work for the World Resources Institute, which is a nonprofit, nonpartisan think tank, and we focus on the intersection of environment and improving people's lives. I'm very delighted to speak here today about America's abundant energy resources and the smart choices we need to make to deliver them. And I have two main points to share with you today. First is that an effective, durable, and affordable energy strategy must consider the risks of climate change. Why? Well, our climate is changing. Uh, each successive decade in the last 50 years has been the warmest on record globally and extreme weather events are on the rise with tens of billions of dollars in damages in the U.S. each year. A 2010 National Research Council report concluded that, quote, climate change is occurring, is caused largely by human activities, and poses significant risks for, and in many cases is already affecting, a broad range of human and natural systems. This is the message of numerous comprehensive science assessments, including the draft National Climate Assessment that was released last month. Directly relevant to this subcommittee, our electric infrastructure and reliability are already being affected and are increasingly vulnerable to droughts and other disruptions caused by climate change. Current impacts on energy production are just the beginning. Unless we change course, these impacts will become more extreme, placing our energy infrastructure and our country at great risk. Which brings me to my second point, which I think is very important. Uh, to avoid the most serious climate change impacts, our energy policy must drive low carbon technologies forward now and build them out at a much larger scale. The good news is that we don't have to choose between energy security and climate security. America is rich in renewable resources and has large opportunities to increase efficiency. According to the National Renewable Energy Laboratory, 80% of our electricity needs can be met in 2050 through renewable generation and existing technology. We can also improve our efficiency across the economy. The National Academy of Sciences found that the U.S. could save 30% of the energy used. And reducing methane emissions from natural gas and capturing and storing CO2 can put us on the cutting edge of technology development, which I think is a, a true win-win. If the U.S., however, and if we decide not to move forward with a low-carbon uh, future now, we risk not only the severe impacts of climate change, but also stranded investments from short-term, poorly informed planning. Many utilities are already factoring in climate change into their investment decisions, and they're looking for regulatory and climate policy certainty. Investments in high-polluting resources 
I think will prove to be a poor bet over time, and these investments will be at direct physical risk from increasing impacts. So without a rapid shift to a low-carbon economy, the U.S. is also going to miss out on the clean technology market around the world. The global market for low-carbon technology could double or triple by 2020. So in conclusion, Mr. Chairman, I think the United States has the opportunity to be both energy and climate secure in the future. And Congress can help and assist in that effort through policies that first ensure climate change risks are more directly incorporated into both public and private decision making. Two, build out America's clean energy sector through an approach that is comprehensive, long-term, targeted, and inclusive. Three, increase energy efficiency across the economy. And four, provide funding and incentives for low carbon and clean energy technologies. Ultimately, Congress worked together uh, to build national energy policies that take these climate risks very seriously and take advantage of all of the opportunities presented by our abundant clean energy resources. Thank you very much for the opportunity, sir. Well, thank you, uh, Ms. Morgan. And Ms. Hutzler, you're recognized for five minutes. Chairman Whitfield, Ranking Member Rush, and members of the subcommittee, thank you for the invitation to participate in today's hearing. The Institute for Energy Research is a nonprofit think tank that conducts research and analysis concerning global energy issues. In the last several years, IER has monitored closely the boom in energy production that is taking place in the United States, primarily on private and state lands. IER also tracks regulations and policies that limit the potential to reduce our dependence on overseas oil regimes, hinder our ability to generate much needed revenues, and harm efforts to foster an energy-based economic recovery that creates jobs. Just this morning, we released a study on the economic effect of immediately opening federal lands onshore and offshore to energy production. According to our analysis, immediately opening federal lands that are currently unavailable because of statutory or administrative action would result in an additional $14.4 trillion to our GDP over the next 37 years. In light of the recent Commerce Department report, the GDP shrank for the first time since 2009. Our economy needs the lasting stimulus that robust energy development on federal lands and waters would provide. But today's hearing is focused primarily on the resource availability and the potential under our feet and off our shores to achieve domestic energy goals, almost unthinkable just a few years ago. In fact, for decades, Americans were asking the question, where will we get the energy we need to heat our homes, fuel our cars, and meet the demands of a strong 21st century economy? Due to hydraulic fracturing and horizontal drilling technologies, we no longer question whether we have the resources. Rather, we question whether we will be able to develop them and thus reap the nationwide economic benefits such development would foster. The myth of energy scarcity that has plagued our national conversation has been exposed. Just in the last year, the misleading refrain that the U.S. only possesses 2% of the world's oil reserves has been replaced by the mounting evidence of our nation's resource abundance. IER highlighted this in an inventory of North America's energy resources. Using government information, we catalog the vast resources of the United States and our neighbors. The U.S. has enough resources to provide reliable and affordable energy for centuries to come. The question is whether the federal government will permit us to access these abundant resources and not whether sufficient resources exist. We can now unlock our shale resources using technology proven for more than 60 years in over one million wells without a single confirmed case of contamination. Furthermore, while our use of fossil energy has dramatically increased over the last 50 years, our air quality has improved. According to the EPA, emissions from the six criteria pollutants under the Clean Air Act have decreased 68% since 1970, even though our energy consumption has increased by 45%. Therefore, however, troubling trends in policy that threaten to restrict access to our vast energy resources, which could make American-made energy less available, affordable, and reliable. Oil shale development has all but stopped because administration policy withdrew research and much-needed leasing activity that could bring these resources to market. Increased oil sands imports from our neighbor Canada could free the U.S. from energy dependence on foreign countries where American workers face increasing threats of kidnapping by terrorists and even murder. But we need the transportation infrastructure to get it here and the energy security that this infrastructure would provide. 
onshore development on federal lands, which is roughly estimated at 700 million acres of subsurface mineral estate, is extremely limited and is increasingly so. In fiscal 2009, for example, the current administration leased fewer onshore acres for energy development than in any preceding year on record. Offshore development on 1.76 billion acres of mineral lands has suffered from a de facto administration embargo, with lease plans canceled, moratoria imposed, and cumbersome re regulatory activity that served to discourage exploration. Today, permitting delays by federal regulators have driven the wait to more than 300 days before drilling can begin on federal lands, about twice as long as it took in 2005. By contrast, states like North Dakota are now turning permits in 10 days, in Ohio 14 days, in Colorado 27 days. Alaska's energy resources lie dormant, even though its pipeline has enough unused capacity to take twice the daily production of North Dakota. Decisions made today about access to energy resources affect energy production for years and decades to come. The more areas accessible to energy production today increases the likelihood of domestic production tomorrow, and with it, increased jobs, government revenues, and economic activity. Thank you for the opportunity to testify today, and I look forward to your questions. Uh, thank you, Ms. Hutzler, and uh, Mr. Vitas, you are recognized for five minutes. Chairman Whitfield, Ranking Member Rush, and members of the subcommittee, I appreciate the opportunity to discuss my work in estimating the U.S. endowment of oil and natural gas resources. Due to technology advancements, the U.S. natural gas and oil resource base is now widely seen as large and diverse. Lower 48 production of shale gas, tidal oil, and associated natural gas liquids has been an engine of economic growth in recent years. Our analysis of the remaining resource base indicates that this unconventional resource base is large and that this production activity is in the early stages of the resource development cycle. Therefore, we expect growing production and increased jobs many years into the future. In recent years, ICF has extensively evaluated shale gas and tidal oil resources, both in terms of technical and economic recovery. This work has been sponsored by private companies industry associations, and government agencies. We, evalu we have evaluated the geologic, historic production, and cost of all the major U.S. and Canadian geologic settings, or as we say, plays. This analysis shows that these resources are geographically widespread and are economic to develop at moderate wellhead prices. The ICF analysis of these emerging natural gas and oil resources is done using a geographical information system the process, a process that evaluates the resources in a highly granular level, accounting for variations in geology, resource quality, and economics within the plays. This ICF analysis reflects recent upstream technology advances, including advances in horizontal drilling and steering, uh, multi-stage hydraulic fracturing, improvements in fracturing fluids and methods, and improvements in seismic and geophysical analysis that helps identify the best locations for the wells. And finally, I would point out advances in that reduce the environmental impacts of drilling. Uh, these are such things as uh, using multi-well drilling pads, uh, conservation of water and recycling of water resources, reformulation of chemical additives, and re reduced emission completions that capture gases in the flowback. These upstream technology advances have enlarged the U.S. economic resource base by expanding areas where the drilling can take place, increasing recovery factors, and reducing capital and operating costs per unit of production. ICF estimates that the remaining technical recoverable U.S. natural gas resource base is 3,850 trillion cubic feet, which represents 155 years of current consumption. The U.S. shale gas resource is almost 2,000 TCF, and that makes up 52 percent of the total. Uh, one should look at these assessments as conservative in the sense that they are used, they are developed assuming current technology, and no, ma no major new plays are discovered. In terms of U.S. oil production, as already been mentioned, U.S. production started increasing in the year 2009 for the first time since 1984. And there is the potential for the U.S. to become a much larger producer in the coming decades due, as we've heard, from expanded production of tied oil. 
our current assessment of U.S. oil resources uh, in terms of technically recoverable resources is 264 uh, billion barrels. This represents 110 years of production at current production rates. The U.S. tidal oil potential is excellent due to the wide range of potential producing plays in diverse geologic settings in numerous basins. The success in tidal oil across a wide spectrum of geologic setting indicates that most historic oil producing areas will eventually cease horizontal drilling. And in many cases, this tidal oil development will dominate activity and production. So in summary, recent advances in drilling and completion technologies have dramatically increased estimates of technically recoverable natural gas and oil resources and have led to a much more optimistic outlook for future oil, gas, and natural gas liquids production. Our forecast for natural gas is that it's going to be growing at about 2.2 percent per year up to about 32 TCF by 2025. And our forecast for the oil production is even faster, 2.6 percent up to 9 million barrels per day by 25. Um, the other point I want to make is that uh, we expect upstream technologies to continue to improve and therefore we expect these resource-based numbers to be going up in the future as well as the economic to improve as well. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Mr. Vitas. Uh, at this time, uh, we'll go into the question and answer period, and I'll recognize myself for five minutes for questions. Uh, once again, I will thank all of you for your testimony. Uh, quite encouraging that we find ourselves in America today with an abundant uh, natural resources, uh, gas, oil, coal, as well as renewables. And uh, your testimony, as I had indicated in my opening statement, how just a short period of time ago, how everyone was talking about we were depleting our natural resources. So it's really exciting that we find ourselves in America in this situation, and particularly at a time when we really are in a global marketplace and we find ourselves competing with other countries uh, for jobs and for job creation. And how many of you attended the World Economic Forum in Davos? Uh, Dr. Jurgen, okay. Now, I had read some comments that there was a lot of discussion in Davos about uh, the focus on American energy independence. And the articles that I read indicate it was a major concern for the Europeans because, fortunately, in America, most of our uh, production and discoveries have occurred on private lands, uh, which we've been able to develop, even though permits on pub public lands is down. And I know that in Europe, uh, a lot of these discoveries are on government-owned lands. But would you make a comment about your observation of the Europeans' views on what's happening in America in the energy sector? Uh, yes. Um, I think it was summarized for me at uh, the World Economic Forum. I asked a prominent journalist what he thought the number one theme was, and I expected him to say the euro, and he said shale. <laughs> and it uh, took me by surprise. But I think that you know it takes time for thinking to catch up with changes. And I think Europe uh, is suffering from enormous uh, unemployment problems. Spain is 26 percent unemployment. And they're looking at the United States and saying, the United States, because of this low-cost, abundant energy, is going to be a very formidable competitor. And uh, people kind of stopping investing in Europe and wanting to transfer their investment uh, to the United States. And I think companies that are European-based saying that they're going to be at a disadvantage competing against the United States. I heard the same thing when I was in uh, China for the publication of uh, my book, The Quest. I spent two weeks there, and I heard the same intense discussion about shale and the sense that the uh, U.S. was going to changing the competitive playing field in the global economy because of this. So I think the rest of the world has really kind of become obsessed with this development in the United States because of how it changes the uh, uh, competition, as I say, in the global marketplace. Well, I agree, and uh, I think we're very fortunate to live here, and uh, the policies that we adopt are going to go a long way in determining how far we can go down this road. And uh, as I said in the beginning, one of our primary focuses today is about economic growth and job creation, and we have the, the, what I'll refer to as the magic key to really facilitate that in many ways. Uh, let me just briefly talk about the export of liquefied natural gas. I know it's controversial, 
and I know there are a lot of different sides to it. My understanding is that a permit has been issued and there's a facility being built in Louisiana for the purpose of doing that. I know the chemical industry, for example, very much opposed to it. But would some of you just make a brief comment on, on what you think about it? I mean, do you think this is something we should uh, be looking at? Uh, when you think about the impact it would have on our trade deficit, too, that's good. But uh, uh, Dr. Jurgen, I know you mentioned it briefly. Just give me your views on that. Well, I think that um, some of us can remember a few years ago when there, we were going to have all these importing facilities for LNG, and you'd look at a map and you'd see 30 or 40 of them, and it turned out uh, it's sort of zero right now. So I think there's a kind of boom discussion about all these facilities. And our conclusion is that the number that will be built is perhaps, you know, you could count them on, on, on one hand, because a lot of the discussion has left out, as I said, the competitive factor that there are a lot of other people, Canada might have three to five just in British Columbia, uh, and they, they cost a lot and a lot of new projects. There's new gas off East Africa. There's new gas uh, off Israel. All of that's going to be coming into the marketplace. So that will kind of put a, a balance out upon it. And, uh, and I think as the, many of us feel in this panel that the issue is that we're demand constrained. We have a, a lot of gas, and so it would not have a uh, dramatic impact on gas costs, and it would unfold over a decade or more. Did you make, want to make a comment, Ms. Morgan? Or we haven't worked extensively on LNG um, okay. exports, but I think um, the key point, I think, across the board is if the U.S. is successful in integrating uh, carbon capture and storage along with gas from shale and other resources, you actually, I think, would have even greater opportunities. See, my time has expired, so at this time I recognize the gentleman from Illinois for five minutes, Mr. Rush. I want to thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Dr. Jurgen, and your testimony, and it's so good to see you again. I remember having breakfast with you and with the Aspen Institute, and uh, I thought you did quite well then, and you're doing quite well now. But in your testimony, you report that the unconventional energy rev revolution supports 1.7 million jobs currently, and that that number will grow in, uh, significantly over the next de decade. Uh, can you speak to uh, these uh, new jobs and what we can expect to see? Um, how will the number grow? The types of jobs that will be created and uh, where these jobs will be located uh, na uh, nationally? Uh, we undertook uh, this research over about the last uh, six or seven months, and we were surprised by a couple of things. One, the scale of the, the jobs. We use the same methodology that the Bureau of Economic Analysis and Commerce Department uses. And secondly, that it really spread across all the, all the states. That's why I mentioned New York and Illinois as examples, right. mm -hmm. because of these long supply chains. And I think this, too, if we talk about the surprise around unconventional resources, the first surprise was the scale of it and the speed, and the second has been this wider economic impact. So the jobs, that 1.7 million that we talk about includes the direct jobs, which would actually be working in the oil and gas fields. It would include the technology jobs, the service jobs that support it. And then it's the jobs that are created, this is called the induced jobs that are created by the rising incomes that people have to spend, and it's the kind of services that would be provided. So it's a kind of package of uh, all of them, and um, it you know it's a demonstration of how tightly integrated our national economy is that it it uh, it goes across the entire country. So it could be everything from uh, somebody working uh, in you know in manufacturing steel in Ohio to somebody working in information technology in California that feeds into this uh, industry. Are we equipped now? Is the American workforce prepared to uh, take these jobs? Who, uh, are we prepared to deal with these jobs? Well, I think so up to a, a point, but it does require training. And for instance, uh, the state of Ohio is getting prepared for activity there, and uh, Governor Kasich there has made a big emphasis on uh, vocational training in the schools uh, to train workers who would be working directly uh, in the oil uh, or gas fields in the Utica shale, as it's called. I think it is striking that this 
job creation or job support has really occurred during a period of high unemployment, and it's been, in a sense, one of the bright spots during this uh, five tough economic years that we've had. Thank you. Ms. Morgan, in your testimony, you state that the U.S. has been a world leader in clean energy research and development, but has had less success uh, relative to other countries in actually developing a domestic clean energy manufacturing industry. Uh, in your opinion, what has prevented the U.S. from developing a robust clean energy manufacturing sector? Uh, thank you. I, we recently did a, an assessment across five countries of the wind and solar value chain uh, to look at who's winning the clean energy race. And what we found across the board is that the countries that are ahead, which include Germany and China, have a long-term policy signal that provides certainty for investors in manufacturing. So you need to have something that goes beyond three years. So now with our short-term benefits, you may see some wind turbines come up, but you may be creating uh, the perverse piece where you're not creating the manufacturing capacity domestically because there's no long-term policy signal around renewable energy. And therefore, you may see the import of those parts because investors don't know what's going to happen in two years or three years. So it's mostly that lack of national renewable energy policy that's lacking here. Along the same lines, uh, what does the U.S. need to do to become a net exporter of clean energy technology? I think there are a number of pieces across uh, the, the value chain that would be essential. The first is that national policy that provides that long-term certainty. So that can be anything from a renewable portfolio standard to a feed-in tariff to whatever policy of choice provides that long-term certainty. The second, really, is putting in place the um, innovation centers that bring together public and private um, actors to be able to develop those new technologies rapidly. The third is to increase our research and development. We're doing pretty well there, but our problem really is that although we're leading the world in R&D, we, um, we're not doing it fast enough vis-a-vis -vis other players. Thank you. Thank you very much. Chairman, you've been very kind. Thank you. This time I recognize the gentleman from Texas, Mr. Barton, for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. <clears throat> I'd like to ask, um, uh, Mr. Jurgen, if he is familiar with the uh, emerging technology on hydraulic fracturing that that uh, greatly minimizes the amount of water that's used. Have you studied that to any detail? I'm certainly uh, uh, aware of uh, companies who are working to perhaps reduce the water requirements by as much as 75 percent. And I think, you know, one of the things when we did this study uh, for the Secretary of Energy Advisory Board we said that this, the needs here, as your question suggests, are going to really promote a lot of innovation. And it sure is a lot of innovation is going into, into the water issues right now, and reducing the water usage is, uh, is a major well, target. There, there's a company in my district, and then there's a number of companies around the country that they haven't commercialized it to a great degree yet, but they have certainly uh, shown that it works on a, uh, on a prototype basis. And some of them can take as much as 99% uh, of the water that's currently used to, to frack a well. Uh, it, it's no longer necessary. And I think if we can solve that issue uh, satisfactorily, uh, the sky's the limit. Uh, I think that seems to be the, the larger environmental issue. Um, and, and Congressman Barton, if I can say, it is striking that this is all you know, this is only in the last four or five years, and already to see this kind of, that it's, that it's on the, to see this innovative response, which is part of our hearing, it kind of shows the, 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 the creativity of our, our industries to respond to immediate needs. When, um, when I was chairman of the, of the um, full committee, we passed a, a bill called the Energy Policy Act of 2005, and, and we put in um, language that gave the Federal Energy Regulatory Commission ultimate say on siting uh, LNG facilities for import. We thought we were going to be importing liquefied natural gas. Uh, that authority is now being used by the FERC to license facilities to export, in some cases the same facility. They're just turning it around. Um, 
do you see LNG for export radically changing the price structure for natural gas, which right now is a little under three dollars a thousand cubic feet? Uh, no, we don't see uh, LNG exports as having a, a major uh, impact on price. I mean, what we see is uh, a continuing growth of supply, and there's actually a need for additional market, whether it's LNG, whether it's vehicles, whether it's electric power, and uh, we we don't think that these projects will have uh, much impact. So you don't see any national security issues if we were to license LNG facilities? We I think we see a gain to national security from the United States being uh, an energy exporter and the influence that that will come from that, that that's a, a net positive for our national security. I happen, to, I happen to agree with that. And finally, I've got about another minute and a half. Um, Dr. Jurgen, how do you see the, uh, the combination of hydraulic fracturing and horizontal drilling uh, in, in terms of oil production? Uh, a lot of companies down in Texas five or six years ago, when I talked to them about using this technology for oil production, they kind of laughed. They said, it's just not the same. It doesn't work. And a company in Houston, EOG, uh, and also a, a, a privately owned company, that Hunt Energy up in Dallas, they decided to try it. And I'll be darned. Uh, all you have to do is look at the Bakken up in North Dakota. Uh, and I think almost all of that production is, is is horizontally drilled with hydraulic fracturing. Do you see that becoming the norm, or do you still see the conventional uh, drilling for oil uh, dominating? I think it's uh, really spreading. I, I mean, it is, as you say, it was only around, you know, this only really is 2009, 2010 that it took off for oil, and, uh, and I think the numbers keep, uh, I don't know what uh, uh, Administrator Siminski would say, but the numbers keep exceeding the projections that's happening so fast, and we see it being applied in traditional areas like the Permian uh, Basin, which uh, has been pronounced dead several times and, of course, is going through another. Yeah, an all-time year last year. Yeah, so uh, I think it's going to be applied, and I think that uh, we'll see probably the impact of this faster globally than we'll see it in terms of natural gas. My final question is to, to Mr. Siminski. Do you see the United States uh, being self-sufficient in oil production in the next 10 years? In oil production? Yes, sir. Uh, in our reference case uh, for the annual energy outlook, which we just published, uh, we have uh, oil self-sufficiency getting down in, you know, to the low 30s, low 30 percent. So 30 percent of our consumption would still be imported. Uh, in the side cases, which we will run and publish uh, in March, so the complete uh, set of side cases for the annual energy outlook, uh, we've looked at what it would take to get to self-sufficiency in oil, and it involves um, closer well spacing, uh, greater estimates of what the resource base is, um, and uh, a number of other uh, factors uh, that would uh, drive oil production higher. We also looked at the demand side, that is, could fuel efficiency standards for automobiles, for example, uh, be improved, and other steps it could take to reduce demand. Uh, in, in that set of circumstances, which requires further policy changes on both uh, supply and demand, uh, we could get to um, a crossover where the U.S. would be self You're not saying it's well. probable, but it is possible. It is possible. Gentlemen's time has expired. Thank you. This time I recognize the gentleman from Texas, Mr. Green, for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I'm, I'm proud to follow my colleague from Texas and uh, the success we've had on uh, directional drilling in both natural gas and oil. Uh, you might remember you were chair of the committee, Congressman Barton, in 05 when we did a bipartisan energy bill that we put in a little provision for the DOE to do a study on directional drilling because they had a great lab in Wyoming to do it. And uh, we had a Houston or a Texas company who was drilling at that time out to 35,000 feet, and they thought they could get to 50,000 and on. And we're seeing some of the success of that, that um, both for natural gas but also for the tight oil, as we call it. Um, 
I've always believed our balanced energy policy must support all domestic sources of energy, including oil, natural gas, and renewables. And again, the last question was, is it we're also using our energy smarter now because each time I buy a new car, I'm getting five to 10 miles more per gallon than I did on the previous one. So we're using our uh, uh, energy smarter. Limiting this production would only serve to jeopardize our small business jobs and increase our reliance on foreign sources of energy. Uh, it may also have an impact on our ability to address climate change because if we fail to provide the natural gas needed to meet our short-term carbon reduction targets while providing affordable, reliable sources to American consumers. Administrator uh, Siminski, the EIA, EIA expects to use natural gas production to remain close to its 2012 level in both 2013 and 14. Is that correct? Uh, um, I know currently there are a lot of wells comprised of just gas or just dry gas that are not being produced due to the low price of natural gas. This is one of the reasons I support the export of LNG so that there is an additional incentive to produce these gas wells. Has EIA looked at what these export opportunities might mean for our future natural gas production levels? Uh, we have done that. If coming back to the point about what's the major driver behind why we have uh, natural gas holding even this year and next year. It's mainly because we're assuming natural gas prices are going to recover up towards $4 by the end of next year. That begins to allow coal to compete more effectively for electric utility um, generation markets and uh, holds, holds uh, natural gas back. So one of the interesting factors here that, that uh, comes into play is that if because of continuing strong supplies, natural gas prices remain low, um, that uh, would actually lead to, to more demand in the electric utility sector. As far as um, LNG is concerned, uh, and in response to the question that Chairman Whitfield asked at the beginning of the hearing, uh, Mr. Green, uh, the U.S. is already uh, exporting natural gas. Uh, we export by pipeline to Mexico and Canada. Of course, we get more gas from Canada. In the reference case uh, that we examined for the annual energy outlook, uh, EIA has um, LNG exports from the lower 48 states um, and Alaska uh, rising towards uh, about 5 percent of domestic output uh, over the period out to 2040. Well, I, I actually have two issues, I guess, on that. One, I represent an area that's heavy in chemical industry who's concerned about the rise in natural gas prices, but I also know that when I drive through South Texas and I see so much flaring of the dry gas because we don't either have the, um, the capacity or the infrastructure or the customers for it, it's just such a waste of our utilization of natural gas. And so uh, if we could sell it to someone, uh, uh, for fifteen dollars in MCF, uh, uh, you know, I wouldn't mind doing that. So, but the EIA has EIA incorporated the increased use of enhanced oil recovery in its oil projections in Texas, for example. The use of uh, EOR has changed our predicted production levels, and you mentioned the Permian Basin area is a good example of that. Uh, we have built in some assumptions uh, along those lines, and you know, in separate cases. Uh, we look at other factors that could help uh, drive oil production. Uh, one of the main questions raised at this hearing is what's the extent of the, the resource um, base? And uh, with, if we were to see the same improvements that have taken place in the last five years in natural gas occurring in uh, the, the oil shale area, uh, what we would end up saying is, is that rather than our roughly um, 6.4 million barrels a day of oil production we had last year, getting up to about eight before it begins to taper off, that it could get up closer to 10 million barrels a day and then hold pretty steady at that level. And one of those things includes uh, uh, better technology and recovery. Well, in 10 million barrels a day sounds like a lot, but I have to actually have five refineries in East Houston and Harris County that use over a million barrels a day right now uh, to make refined products. So we still are going to have to import or produce uh, the needs for our own country. Um, Gentlemen, gentlemen's time has expired. Oh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. At this time, I recognize Vice Chair Mr. Scalise for five minutes.
Well, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Appreciate you having this hearing on America's energy security and, and specifically to look at an assessment of, of our resources uh, because, you know, when you, I think the chairman had mentioned, uh, the first natural gas uh, facility, the first LNG export facility is, uh, is in South Louisiana. I've actually toured that facility, uh, Chenier's facility in South Louisiana. And, and that was originally built to be an import facility because we didn't think we had the reserves that we needed for natural gas. Uh, and then eventually because of the technology, the advancements uh, that brought all these shale plays online, now the actual opposite has happened where we have so much uh, that in many cases they're, they're not even drilling in areas where, where they have leases because, uh, because all of a sudden we found these resources that we didn't really know we could access just a few years ago. And so they spent billions of dollars to retrofit and, and shift that from an import facility to an export facility, uh, allowing us to create more American jobs and to continue to advance that uh, that new technology, uh, which has really helped start a revolution, as, as I think a number of you talked about in your testimony. And I want to ask you, Ms. Hutzler, uh, because you specifically mentioned uh, production on federal lands versus non-federal lands, and it's one of the misnomers that we hear about up here in Washington. Uh, you know, and the president will go around saying uh, production's never been higher. And yet you actually look in some of his policies that have shut production off on federal lands in the areas where the federal government doesn't currently have the ability to go and, and have an impact in those states where they're seeing uh, a real revolution, it's on non-federal lands. So if you can touch a little bit on that uh, about maybe some of the factors behind uh, such an increase on non-federal lands where you, where you actually have some problems, in some cases reductions on federal lands on production. Uh, production, uh, for instance, production of oil on um, private and state lands over the past five years has increased is, is essentially 96 percent of the total production that we've gotten. And the reason generally is that there's a lot of red tape when you try to deal with production on federal lands. And I think I mentioned in my opening remarks and in my testimony that it takes over 300 days to now get a permit to uh, drill on federal lands, where in the states it's less than 30 days. So all of this is taking much um, longer for a company to invest uh, their money in terms of trying to, to deal with production on federal lands. Yeah, and we can see, especially if, if you look at uh, the, the shale natural gas plays, uh, they're, they're actually regulated. You know, the EPA might try to give the impression uh, that, that there's no federal regulations and they need to step in. And I think that concerns a lot of people because the EPA doesn't have a good track record of implementing good regulations where states have actually done a, a really good job at regulating natural gas shale plays. And, and frankly, the 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 topography in Louisiana is a whole lot different than it is in Pennsylvania or North Dakota or Texas. And so the states have the ability to do that much better and, and have a great track record, by the way, of doing that. And so I think it's a good point to make because uh, where we've seen real growth and not only in, in energy but in jobs, uh, where, where you, know, you go to North Dakota, the lowest unemployment in the nation, uh, they have up there because of all of this new uh, economic growth coming from this technology. And so we surely don't want to see the federal government come in and try to slow that down in the name of, of good regulations when, in fact, you already have good regulations, but the way it's supposed to be done, and that is where the states themselves do it. Um, I want to ask you, uh, Mr. Mr. Vetus, because you've looked at some of, the, some of the data. We get data from the Energy Information Agency, and, and they've even shown that there's been a decrease in production on federal lands. But some, some of the uh, information you have on resources, on the known resources, are dramatically higher, I think 50 percent in some cases higher uh, than the numbers that come out of EIA. Can you explain uh, what data you look at that shows that, that the outlook for this country is even better than what we get from, from the, uh, the EIA's numbers? Well, in any type of resource assessment, there's going to be uncertainty because what we're talking about is some activity that is yet to happen. So we're predicting then the productivity of potentially hundreds of thousands of wells that will be drilled in the future. And the way we do it is to first start with the geology and to develop maps of each of the plays. And we try to deal with the, and get data on the key parameters, like uh, what's called the, the structure maps, which is the drilling depth you need to go down to, the thickness of the shale, some of the parameters of the shale in terms of their carbon content, their porosity, the pressures and temperatures. And from that, we can develop what's called a gas in place estimate, which is an estimate of how much gas there is in the ground in the formations that would be targeted. And then we have information on wells that have already been drilled 
and we can look at their uh, production profiles and estimate over their lives how much gas they're going to produce. So for example, if we looked at Pennsylvania and we looked at the Marcellus Shale, we would see that the horizontal wells there <coughs> that have been drilled have been improving in their terms of their productivity, and now we're producing about four and a half billion, billion cubic feet per well. But that's in the better parts of the play because producers have gone to look for the best gas first, the most economic gas. But then we can look at the other areas of the play in terms of either being thinner or less pressure or lower porosity, and we can correct for the productivity using basic engineering principles and thereby forecast out into the future, the future productivity of the wells, which we think on average will be about half of that, maybe two BCF per well. All right, well, so I appreciate we your, I know I'm looking, I'm seeing I'm out of I'm time, sorry. I apologize, but I thank you for your testimony and your answers, and uh, Mr. Chairman, I yield back. No. Uh, at this time, I recognize the gentlelady from California, Ms. Capps, for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, very much, and thank you, each of you, for your testimony. You know, assessing our current energy resources is obviously important, especially in the light of the numerous advancements in research and technology in recent years. And that's why I appreciate today's hearing, but I am concerned that we're not getting the full picture. Today's testimony and the questions coming from the majority have focused overwhelmingly on fossil fuels. Oil, natural gas, and coal obviously dominate our energy supply, but they're certainly not the only resources available. The EIA Energy Outlook makes this clear, pointing out that renewable energy sources such as solar, wind, and biofuels make up a sizable fortune, portion of our energy use. So my question, first question is to you, Administrator Siminski. EIA projects that use of renewables will continue to grow, in some cases by double digits. Is that right? Uh, yes, that is correct. Uh, we actually have renewables growing the fastest in percentage terms of all of the fuel sources over the period out to 2040. Uh, I'd also like to point out that the share of generation of electricity from renewables grows, uh, grew about 13% in 2001, uh, should grow at about 16% annually out to 2040. Electricity generation from solar and to a lesser extent wind uh, energy sources grows as recent cost declines make them more economical. Um, the 2013 projection is a little bit less optimistic about advanced biofuels. Uh, because of the difficulty that uh, the companies have had in, in gearing up their manufacturing uh, process. Uh, but in general, uh, renewables are growing pretty strongly and uh, help uh, the fact that overall uh, carbon dioxide emissions from energy uh, in our forecast uh, actually remain below the peak that we reached uh, of six uh, billion metric tons that was hit in 2005. So it stays below that level the entire forecast period. Thank you. And in addition to what you just said, um, Ms. Morgan, uh, you established the well, a direct link between burning fossil fuels and climate change. And that has already been well established from a variety of sources. And we've begun to see these impacts if we just even look at extreme weather events like Hurricane Sandy, droughts, all the droughts and the wildfires as well. And uh, I represent a coastal state and a coastal district. I'm particularly mindful of climate change impacts on higher sea levels and increasing uh, erosion. Yes. Ms. Morgan, in your testimony, you discussed some of these impacts. Could you elaborate uh, particularly on sea level rise and increased erosion uh, for those of us who do represent coastal communities? Certainly, yes. Um, sea level rise is one of the major threats to the United States and is already occurring. Um, along the eastern seaboard and certainly also on the west coast. I'm uh, familiar, we've done some work uh, looking in Florida, uh, particularly where you see that um, Miami Beach is already having to spend more than $200 million to overhaul its storm damage system. You're seeing that Hallandale Beach has to spend $10 million a year on new wells because of saltwater intrusion. Florida is built on limestone, which means sea walls don't help much. So, uh, so that is a, a major piece of worry. Also, certainly the energy infrastructure that's located along the coast is, is also at risk. I just want to add an example to that. I represent the central coast of California, and the city of Pismo Beach is installing seawalls itself to protect two sewage lift stations that are threatened by erosion. And in Santa Barbara, um, our central creek that comes right down through the heart of the city uh, has 
been widened to increase its flood capacity. capacity. These projects come at a high cost, and I know these communities have struggled to find necessary resources. Uh, one final in the last few seconds, is this something other communities are also struggling with in the, and finding that the cost is really uh, prohibitive? Absolutely. Uh, in, I know in Florida there's four counties that have joined together and are facing tremendous costs. If you look here in Lewis, Delaware, not far away from here, you have communities that are struggling with it. Go up to Maine. Uh, so it's a real issue that we need to face on our infrastructure investments, but also the cost to local communities. It puts an imperative on emission reductions as well. Thank you very much. I'll yield back. This time, I recognize the gentleman from Nebraska, Mr. Terry, for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And uh, this fall, I hosted a natural gas forum in Omaha, where we had representatives from just about every facet of the natural gas world, from users, producers, and potential future users. Uh, one theme came from that, and that's uh, that we have a great supply of natural gas. We can argue 100 years or 150 years. That there is enough supply that we could expand the uses of natural gas into transportation. Uh, and this begs the question of, well, we've been talking about exporting surplus, but we could also have discussions of additional uses of natural gas. But one thing always came back, and that's the uncertainty of regulations. And the regulations, when you drilled further down, were defined as uncertainty about whether the government, federal government, was going to start regulating fracking and how, if and how. And that that in itself is the worry for the users. I am one of those that feels that uh, expanding natural gas uh, into vehicles uh, will help our country, not only because we're using a domestic product, but the fact that uh, we a diversity in auto fuels, whether we start with trucks, heavy trucks, or whatever, uh, enhances our nat uh, national security status. So uh, starting with uh, uh, Siminski, Mr. Siminski Honorable, and then going down, uh, this is the question I would like to have your respective opinions, and is that, is it fair to say that moving more of our transportation to natural gas will impact our national security? Uh, thank you, Mr. Congressman, for calling me honorable. I, I guess I get that because the Senate confirmed me in my appointment. I tell people that a lot of folks in my new place of employment call me sir, and that's very different than when I was in the private sector, but I have to fly economy when I travel. <laughs> I understand that. Uh, with the 9% approval rating here in uh, we get called a lot of things, but honorable is not one of them. <laughs> um, I, I think that you're on to a really interesting question here. Um, we have actually took a look at how quickly natural gas could grow in transportation, and it's a, it's a very small number now. I mean, it hardly, it, it round, rounding error in terms of percentages. Uh, we do use 3% um, of our natural gas to move natural gas in the pipelines, but when most people think about transportation, they're thinking about trucks or, or cars and so on. Uh, we believe that uh, LNG and freight trucks and, and then eventually natural gas being turned into uh, liquids like a, a high quality diesel fuel, uh, and there's a, a plan under consideration down in Louisiana to do just that. Uh, could actually uh, almost double the amount of total natural gas and transportation so that we could get up from uh, 3% now uh, to uh, uh, maybe easily 6% and possibly as high as 8 or 9%. Um, a lot of that is because natural gas prices from a pricing standpoint look really, really attractive compared to global oil prices. So uh, there's a lot of effort underway there. I think I have, uh, we have pretty much the same view as uh, 
EIA that, uh, you know, it does now appear that natural gas will become an important fuel for uh, large trucks, uh, for railroads and so forth. Uh, at this point, don't see it becoming a major fuel for private automobiles uh, because of the um, nature of the infrastructure and so forth that would be needed. No, I'd like to hear your opinion. <laughs> Happy to. You're the contrarian here. I, um, we haven't done extensive research on this area, but the one piece that I can add to the discussion perhaps is that it's clear that gas has a low, lower global warming potential than oil. Yes. So from that perspective, uh, it's more beneficial. And I think, as I was saying earlier, if we can also tackle the carbon capture and storage piece of that, uh, you'll see even greater benefit. All right. Thank you. Uh, from our standpoint, we essentially agree with Dr. Jurgen in the sense that um, it's certainly there's certainly a market in the heavy truck area, and it's easier to deal with the infrastructure problems there of supplying the natural gas. But in the private sector, for residential vehicles, it's it, home vehicles, it's more difficult. Um, the analysis that we've done is very similar. That although we expect natural gas and liquefied natural gas vehicles to triple their use over the next 20 or 25 years, it still represents a relatively small part of the overall sector. Uh, the more likely way that natural gas could be used to displace oil would be through gas to, to liquids technologies or even using natural gas to generate electricity and then using electricity in, in, in battery cars. Gentlemen's time has expired. Thank you. This time, I recognize the gentlelady from California, Ms. Matsui, for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I'd like to also thank the witnesses for being with us today. I'm pleased to be back on the Energy and Power Subcommittee of this Congress, and I look forward to working with my colleagues to comprehensively address our nation's energy needs, and that also includes uh, dealing with climate change. Right now, there are thousands of clean technology companies manufacturing innovative products that will help fundamentally shift our country away from carbon-intensive energy sources. Many of these are small business owners and entrepreneurs. My district of Sacramento has over 220 such companies. I've seen firsthand the progress they have made in solar, wind, hydrogen fuel cells, and waste to energy conversion techniques. These companies are working on cutting-edge technology to ensure that America remains a leader in green energy global market. We're rapidly losing ground in the sector to countries like China and Germany, who are heavily investing in the renewable energy markets, and the U.S. must level the playing field to allow our clean technology companies to better compete. Low-carbon energy sources must have a seat at this table. Energy efficiency must have a seat at this table and clean energy technology must have a seat at this table. Anything less is short-sighted and detrimental to our economy and environment on our energy goals. I want to follow up to um, Ranking Member Rush's uh, questions regarding the clean energy manufacturing sector. Last month, uh, Chairman Emeritus John Dingle and I introduced H.R. 400, which is a bill to promote American clean energy exports and increase clean energy manufacturing. This bill passed the House with bipartisan support during the 111th Congress, and it's my hope that this committee will consider it soon. Ms. Morgan, can you expand on the economic benefits we would receive by boosting our clean energy manufacturing sector? Certainly. I think um, one key piece, if, you're, if we're able and hopefully will build out our manufacturing sector, would be in the area of jobs. Uh, currently, according to the Energy and uh, Environment Study Institute, uh, you have more jobs created in clean energy than you do in oil, fossil, and coal combined. And a recent study by the University of California actually looked at the fact that you can, uh, over time, if you were to really uh, go for 30 percent renewables mm -hmm. and push your energy efficiency in the economy, you could have 4 million jobs by 2030. So the job benefits are certainly uh, significant, that's for sure. Okay, and um, in your testimony, um, one of your recommendations is that we must build out America's renewable energy sector. Now, what are some criteria that policymakers should consider for driving clean energy growth and competitiveness? I think the main criteria right now, if I look at where the United States stands on clean energy, is 
the clear, long-term, long, loud, and legal signal that investors are looking for to see that this is a growing area. So that means that national renewable energy policy, mm -hmm. I think it can take many different forms, but optimally one that goes beyond three years. I think certainly having grid access uh, for those renewable energy is another uh, key criteria that I would look for. And I would add in training. Uh, I think the other piece that's very important, Colorado is doing some work on this, in, and that's happening in Germany, is a really specific training program, big job opportunities. Okay, and do you think we need to consider creative financing options for smaller clean energy companies to succeed? Definitely. I mean, I think that if you look at, uh, there's a number of different innovative ways that uh, you can bundle the demand for renewable energy and create new financing mechanisms to do that. We've had some experience of that in the U.S., and we're now seeing that happening in India as well. Thank you. And I also believe, too, as we look forward, we're not, because of my focus on clean energy, clean energy technology does not at all mean that we cannot look at the transitional aspects of things like uh, natural gas, um, as long as I believe we look at uh, some of the areas of carbon capture and storage, which I think needs to be looked at alongside um, the wonderful uh, aspects of how much gas we have. So anyway, I really appreciate uh, your testimony, and I hope that we can continue the conversation on looking at somewhat all of the above as we move forward. Thank you very much. I yield back my time. Thank you. At this time, I recognize the gentleman from uh, Illinois, Mr. Shimkus, five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I thank the uh, panel for coming uh, to uh, Mr. Siminski and, and Dr. Jurgen, and actually um, Hutchler and um, I can't see the name, and we don't have paper anymore, so Vitus. I have to go flip back on this iPad to find the testimony a couple times. The uh, Because in your in your presentation, a lot of you have the, the maps and the various plays, um, whether it be the uh, shale, tide oil, coal bed, others um, in your testimony. Uh, what I'd like to know is how far behind are we from the uh, pipeline infrastructure to, to move this uh, product? I mean, the pipeline issue, we're, you know, we're doing with the Keystone and Keystone XL. Part of the North Dakota play is the problem is uh, we don't have access to a pipeline, so a lot of this uh, North Dakota oil is, is being inefficiently trucked down versus through pipelines. So can you, can you all just briefly talk about pipeline infrastructure? Uh, thank you, Mr. Chimbus. So just to start, uh, the, the infrastructure issues take time. I mean, you, you can often get uh, some production going and you get a lot of wells being drilled. Uh, whether or not companies can then afford to build the, the pipeline infrastructure to move uh, those products, oil and gas, around uh, depends on their own view about how long the production activity yeah, and, last. If you just be a little brief, because most of the pipeline infrastructure now is based upon traditional oil and gas right. and refineries and the like. So all these new plays are in areas where there may not be access to. So exactly. uh, I, I, I guess the point is, is that something we ought to consider in, in public policy debates? Dr. Jurgen? Yeah, I absolutely think so. I mean, it's like I said, our, our thinking needs to catch up with reality. Our logistics need to catch up with new production. Everything's been turned upside down. Instead of going uh, south-north, it's going north-south. Uh, big question, you know, we just sur managed to uh, survive, uh, save those refineries on the East Coast, uh, but they have to be hooked into the North Dakota. We see, as you say, trucking. We see railroad cars. Ultimately, the most efficient way to move these supplies is uh, by pipeline. Canada's output of oil sands is equivalent to Libya's before the uh, uh, before the revolution. There, that's su that supply. You know, we talk about U.S. energy independence. It's really a North American integration. So we've got to get our, our you know a pipeline system that catches up with the fact that uh, technology's changed. There's also some oil being barged down on the Mississippi, and there was a, a recent. Uh they ran into the bridge down in the southern part of the, the lower miss. Yeah. So, I mean, there's also issues with that type of transportation. Ms. Hustler? Yes, I agree with Dr. Jurgen. Um, we do have oil that's landlocked in North Dakota. We have buildup in our storage facilities in Cushing. 
and it is more efficient to move by pipeline. We're moving by rail now. I think I saw a number of 800,000 barrels a day, which is pretty substantial. And it's also safer to move it by rail than it, I mean, by uh, pipeline than rail. Mr. Vitus? Uh, I agree with the other uh, speakers that uh, the oil and natural gas infrastructure that's going to be needed to move this oil and gas to market is very important. Um, and it involves a substantial investment each year and thousands of miles of pipe. Uh, the other point that I would uh, emphasize as well is that pipelines in general tend to be the least uh, expensive and usually the safest way to transport uh, both gas and oil. Uh, thank you. And, and just I'll just uh, finish with Dr. Jurgen. Uh, this whole uh, debate on slowing down or not exporting natural gas I find pretty problematic as natural gas is just a basic commodity product, just like corn or beans or pork or anything else, and that uh, you, it has to be priced in the world market, and we have to get it. You mentioned in your, your comment that there is a need for additional markets. Why did you say that, and what do you mean by that? Well, uh, because we've seen, as been described by uh, my colleagues in this panel, this growth, is, this technology has opened up a huge amount of new supply, and right now, not you know, there's a lot of supply that can't get to market, and you see uh, activity going down. So, so if, there's the market, no, if there's no price signal, then all these jobs for uh, location, discovery, and, re and recovery would be gone because right. there's no price signal to continue to. Yeah, what's happened is, of course, a lot of it's flipped into looking for either oil or for gas that's rich with liquids. But nevertheless, I think it's generally, the general view is that at this low level, that this is not a sustaining price to maintain uh, the growth in supply that we need for our electric power, that we need for our industry, and that we might need for transportation and, and to, to meet global markets. Great. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Yes. Um, at this time, I recognize the gentlelady from Virgin Islands, Ms. Christensen, for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and I want to thank you and the ranking member for this hearing as well. Uh, Mr. Siminski, um, I represent a U.S. territory, the, the U.S. Virgin Islands, and they are plagued with the highest rates of electricity in the United States. In my district of the U.S. Virgin Islands, current electricity rates are five times the national average. An average family pays, if they can, 5.8 cents per kilowatt, compared to ni the 9.83 U.S. average. A visit to the web your website shows a very clear breakdown of state electricity profiles with U.S. average retail price reported. But in order to find information about the territories, you have to really search, and it's quite confusing. The majority of information is on a beta site that's there, it says, for public testing and comment only. Um, and there's a country analysis brief on the Virgin Islands, but this is really unacceptable. So why is it that the territory's electricity cost information is not included there, even if it's uh, as an outlier? And what can we do to have that information included? Um, thank you, uh, Congresswoman Christensen. I, I said uh, at my confirmation hearings that EIA needed to get its uh, data better, faster, and cheaper, and uh, we're working on that. Um, we uh, need to receive uh, complete and timely data from everybody. Uh, this has been a problem with some of the territories, uh, but I will look into that question and uh, and I'll see and, what we can do. And we can work to try be to happy, make sure that you have the information also. Be I happy It's to important do that. for that information to be out there. Um, thank you. We've spent a lot of time talking today about oil and gas resources, but the U.S. is, as has been said by um, Ms. Morgan and other, others, that we're blessed with ample renewable energy resources as well. The question is whether we and the rest of the world are doing enough, quickly enough, to develop those clean energy resources and make our economies more energy efficient. Last November, the IEA released their World Energy Outlook for 2012 and found that our current energy system is unsustainable. And they projected a little that in a little more than 20 years, we could see gl average global temperatures increase up to 6.5 degrees Fahrenheit, as approximately 80% of future global emissions are already locked in by existing infrastructure. Ms. Morgan, how much would we have to reduce fossil fuel use in order to prevent more than a two, uh, I think that would be two degrees centigrade rise in temperature, and what does it mean that we would be locked, in, locked into these emissions? 
Thank you. Um, well, on the longer term, what the scientific estimates state is that we need to be reducing our emissions by 80 to 95 percent by 2050, which means that we have to really have the longer term in, our, in mind. Uh, the, the, the estimates for a 2020 time period for developed countries tends to be around a 25 to 40 percent reduction. The United States has made a commitment of 17 percent. I think the thing to recognize is that there are points of no return where we hit tipping points, mm -hmm. where you're no longer able to restore coral reefs, where the Arctic ice mel uh, melts completely. Those are the types of irreversible impacts and the, and the lock-in of our infrastructure uh, that you know, comes from the current pathway on high carbon is, is very much responsible for that. And you know, they also say that it's possible to prevent that two degree centigrade increase if we were to act to reduce the CO2 emissions prior to 2017. So I don't know if you wanted to comment and Mrs. Saminski wanted to comment on what is it that, you know, the window we have is rapidly closing, it hasn't closed yet, um, but the IEA has said that it's ambitious but still possible. So what is it that we would have to do? What kind of technology should be included in this rapid development and deployment policy if we could reduce that increase, to, in order to reduce that increase by 2017? I'll answer quickly and then. Uh, I think the key, key points are we have to have a revolution in the renewable energy space and energy efficiency. We have these technologies now. We need to put in place the policy frameworks and the R&D to get those going. We need to price carbon. Most other major economies around the world price carbon. It uh, drives efficiency, uh, and we, we need very much to, to drive R&D uh, much more quickly. Mr. It's only five years. <laughs> I, I won't uh, make any policy recommendations, but I'd, I'd like to point out that this is a global issue. So to deal with the, the two degree centigrade, uh, we need uh, cooperation around the world. Uh, EIA's forecasts. Uh, show that almost all of the growth in carbon dioxide emissions from energy will be taking place in the non-OECD countries, so uh, outside of the developed world. So what we really need is to uh, help uh, countries like China and India move towards lower carbon fuels. I think one other thing just to add is our, our CO2 emissions from energy consumption are down 13 percent since 2007, so this is already actually happening. And the other thing that we can do that has a huge impact is simply become more energy efficient. We're twice as energy efficient as a nation as we were a few decades ago. We have technologies and tools to do that today, and that's the big thing. But as Adam Siminski says, uh, the growth is in the emerging markets, and uh, those numbers tend to overwhelm what we're doing. Thank you. I think your time is up. Time's up. Uh, this time, I recognize the gentleman from Texas, Ms. Dr. Burgess, for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and I thank you for convening this panel. It really has been a fascinating morning. I'm going to start off this new session of Congress by agreeing with the ranking member of our committee in his opening statement. He said we must not betray our children and our future generations. I agree with him. Now, while he was referencing carbon capture and storage, I would reference the economic conditions that have prevailed for the past four or five years. The last two Congresses, I was also on the Joint Economic Commission. It was our duty the first Friday of every month to receive from the Bureau of Labor Statistics the employment numbers from the previous month. And you saw a pattern emerging through all of that bad news. And there was a lot of bad news during those years. But mining and manufacturing always led that list of new job creation. Now, we see this morning uh, Forbes magazine is reporting that four out of the top ten best places to live in the world are in Texas. I knew that. They, they didn't need to tell me. But Austin leads the list, followed by Houston second, Dallas third, San Antonio ninth. In fact, the state of Texas has added uh, almost a half million people over the past years from last summer to uh, summer of 2011 to the summer of 2012. And that the reason for that, of course, is is the availability of energy and the cost of energy. And while energy in and of itself cannot be its own end, it does help drive our economy. So when we talk about not wanting to betray our children and future generations, I think we have a responsibility to the economy. And part of that responsibility is the energy supply that's available uh, to, uh, to, uh, to our economy. Uh, Dr. Christensen talked about tipping points. I'll just 
ask an open-ended question. I know you guys don't like to speculate, but um, what kind of tipping point we, we, would we have seen with the economy of the last four or five years in the absence of shale? What, what might have happened to our economy without the ability to produce this energy and produce these jobs? And either Dr. Jurgen or, or the Honorable Siminski uh, would like to hear your thoughts on that. Well, if we had remained on the track that we uh, had been on prior to uh, when we were going to build all those LNG receiving stations, we'd probably be spending $100 billion a year now to import uh, LNG into the country. So that would have been a big burden. Uh, secondly, had we not seen this increase, uh, this substantial increase in oil production, as I said, this equivalent to uh, Iran's uh, total exports before sanctions, uh, we'd be paying a lot higher prices uh, for oil. Uh, and uh, it would be a much, 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 much tighter and more vulnerable market. And we would not have had what we've seen is that these supply chains are so long in our economy. Right. These are dollars that stay here that go into jobs here rather than going into a sovereign wealth fund somewhere else in the world. So uh, in that other universe, it would have been a, a, a much more difficult uh, picture and more congruent with what seemed to be the picture in front of people in 2008. Yes, sir. It's, there's virtually every economic study that I've seen suggests that higher uh, domestic production of, of fuels leads to greater GDP. Um, and uh, when you get to the import issue, you obviously have a uh, lower trade deficit. Um, all of that um, helps the economy, uh, leads to greater job creation, as uh, Dr. Jurgen said. Um, I think one of the things to keep in mind is that uh, the availability of relatively low-cost natural gas has actually, I believe, helped uh, to sustain some of the growth in um, wind uh, and uh, solar on the renewable side because those are intermittent sources. They need a backup supply, and it's often natural gas uh, that provides the backup for uh, these uh, rapidly growing renewables that uh, that are are uh, going to uh, become a fairly significant part of U.S. energy production and consumption. Sure. We have uh, peaking plants in, in North Texas where in the summertime when the air conditioners are all cranked down low, uh, even if you had a substantial wind component, you'd never be able to keep up with that peak demand. I just got to tell you, this is such a different hearing than we had in this very room in 2008. And uh, I, I mean, it is, it's good news. It's good news for the American people. It's good news for the American economy. Regardless of political party or political persuasion, this is, this is, a, this is a good news hearing. The other part of good news, and, and Mr. Vetus, I don't want to leave you out down in the end. Yesterday, flying up here, reading in the Fort Worth Star-Telegram, and the, uh, the concept of having an environment, environmentally friendly fracking fluid that is being developed now by Halliburton in Texas. I understand other companies are doing that as well, but the technology is changing, and it's changing in a way that is environmentally responsible. You referenced some of that in your testimony, but do you have additional thoughts on that? Yes. What I said was is there are several ways in which the industry has tried to adapt their technologies to reduce the footprint of drilling these wells. Uh, one is the surface footprint in trying to reduce the amount of space that it takes by combining multiple wells on a single pad, and that can reduce the amount of uh, space used by a factor of eight. The other point that I made is the in the, in the drilling fluids themselves, which in the old days we had been formulated with um, diesel oil, that has almost totally been eliminated now, and some of the toxic substances in the, uh, the frac fluids are being replaced by more uh, environmentally benign fluids. And then the other point that has been raised is the use of water itself. Uh, typically, a well will take about 3 million gallons in terms of the fracking process. And one of the ways the industry is reducing that is by recycling the water and being able to use it over and over again. And the other thing that they've been doing is trying to reduce the total amount of water used by various different techniques, including substituting other fluids such as uh, CO2, nitrogen, and in some cases propane instead of water. The gentleman's Thank time you. is expired. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. This time, recognize the ranking member, Mr. Waxman from California, five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I, I appreciate that we've made great advances, and it is a reason for celebration. We ought to be very pleased with the advantages that uh, come to us with the production of uh, more oil and gas resources. And we now have advances in technology that have allowed us to drill in many new areas. But as we congratulate ourselves for these new discoveries, 
We also, I think, need to discuss how energy choices we are making today will have long-term impacts for our climate. Scientists agree we have a rapidly diminishing window to act to reduce our carbon pollution before the catastrophic impacts of climate change are irreversible. Uh, Ms. Morgan, in your testimony, you, you say the United States cannot and should not make energy decisions without factoring in the risks associated with climate change. Uh, this committee is charged with developing energy policy for the United States. Ms. Morgan, how should this committee factor in climate when making energy policy? Well, I think that um, if you look longer term, it is quite important. First of all, you need to take into account the intensity, the greenhouse gas intensity of the fuels you are looking at, and you need to price, put a price on those fuels in order to drive innovation and energy efficiency. That is point one. The second point, I think, is that although our emissions of CO2 have reduced extensively, which is very good news, they are plateauing out. Uh, and uh, emissions of methane and other gases are increasing. So that means that we need to put in place a mandatory and voluntary approaches to reduce methane emissions as well. And we need a, a very solid uh, renewable energy approach. The countries that are moving forward, you see those kind of three pieces in there. Carbon pricing, renewable energy policy, energy efficiency standards are all quite important. And then support mechanisms around those to make them work. Mm -hmm. I have been on this committee for a number of decades, and I remember the period of time when um, we decided that um, uh, we will continue to subsidize the fossil fuels through not requiring them to pay their external costs, and in some cases directly through the tax code. And we undermined the alternatives that could have um, made us less dependent on these fossil fuels, which made us, of course, more dependent on Saudi Arabia and Iran and other countries that were the OPEC countries that held us hostage. Uh, we made a mistake not diversifying our energy sources at that time. Uh, we, we should develop our energy policy under this new circumstance uh, that doesn't make the same mistakes and put us all in the same situation where we'll look back and regret that we didn't recognize that our energy policy had to be more thought through. What are the potential economic repercussions if we fail to integrate climate risk with our energy policy making? I think that there are um, three main risks. I think the first really is around stranded investments, because I think companies today that are investing in high carbon infrastructure without putting in place the, the mechanism to deal with CO2 are, are being short-sighted, and that as climate change unfortunately gets worse and policies get put in place, those will be stranded investments. And if we wait to act, those will likely be more expensive uh, as we go forward. The second really is missing out on new uh, and existing markets around the world, which are growing exponentially. You're, you're looking at up to seven trillion in new capital and renewables by by 2030. So there's and there's national policies in every other major economy in the world on renewables. They're serious about this. They're moving forward for a range of reasons. And the third are the impacts actually on our infrastructure itself and on the country, which. Uh, as you know, if, uh, as the EIA said, if we keep going the way we're going, you're looking at a 10.8 degree Fahrenheit rise in temperature, which is unprecedented in our time. Dr. Jurgen, um, aside from the investment we ought to be making in looking at uh, alternative energy sources, uh, uh, renewables, efficiency, some of that research is threatened by the budget cuts that members want to make. Do you think we ought to develop a policy that looks at the environmental consequences of where we're going in energy development? I, I think so. I think it's there. I, in the 1990s, I headed a task force on energy R&D for the Department of Energy, and I think one of the things that I found, you know, we found very distressing was this volatility in spending on R&D, and whether you're talking about, you know. Uh, MIT, where more people are working on solar than anything else, or advances in, in drilling or whatever it is, I think that a sustained commitment to R and D is really from the, that, is the most important investment. I absolutely agree with you. But aside from that, do you think we ought to make policies in in the energy area that look at not just the research, but the uh, consequences 
to the future in reducing carbon emissions? Well, I think so. I mean, I think so. I think environmental considerations are obviously and should be part of uh, uh, how you make energy policy. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Gentleman's time has expired. The gentleman from Louisiana, Mr. Casty. Mr. Jurgen, uh, there are those who say that we shouldn't export liquidified natural gas because in some way by doing so we will promote the production of more natural gas and therefore contribute to global warming. But what you're saying is that is absurd because if we don't do it, Australia or Canada or some other country will export liquefied natural gas. Is that a fair statement? Yeah, I think people will f fill the market and f fill the need and, in fact, are racing ahead to do that. Now, as they race ahead, it's fair to say that if it's a $5 billion or $10 billion project to create one of these export terminals, those are a heck of a lot of jobs that will be sacrificed because of an absurd premise. Again, is that a fair statement? The, the absurd premise is that... Being that if we don't export liquefied natural gas, then... CO2, excuse me, then, then natural gas will not be mined. Right. Well, I think, in fact, uh, a number, if you take a country like China, which, uh, as uh, Adam Siminski pointed out, uh, is very heavily oriented towards coal and wants to uh, reduce its use of coal for, to, uh, and use more natural gas to produce electricity to reduce pollution, uh, they'll look in one direction or another and, and if we're sending natural gas, we would be contributing to their reducing their pollution. So if we can create those jobs, we will simultaneously improve our economy, but to improve, decrease carbon release worldwide, potentially. Yeah. Yeah, I think what's happening now is... Uh, okay, I'm going to let you hold that. Okay. okay. Good. Um, Sorry. <laughs> Mr. Siminski, uh, in 2007, you published a report at the request of Congress demonstrating subsidies for different sources of fuel. And at that time, biofuels got uh, $5.72 $5 per million BTU subsidy from the government. Solar got $2.82. Uh, coal got $0.04 cents per million BTU. And natural gas got $0.03 cents per million BTU. Your up updated report uh, did not have this chart. But when we speak about subsidies for various forms of energy, there's an order of magnitude difference here. Uh, is that still the ballpark of the federal subsidies? I'd have to uh, look at the numbers, Congressman, but uh, the number of assumptions and, and factors that you have to take into consideration to uh, do those calculations are, are numerous and complex, uh, but I think it's fair to say that uh, in addition to fossil fuel subsidies, that there obviously are also subsidies on renewable fuels and many of the other things that we do. Yeah, like a hundredfold, huh? A hundredfold going to uh, the renewables. Um, Mr. Jurgen, back to you. When you're at the World Economic uh, Summit, um, you're right. If we don't send energy to Japan, their economy will tank. That's on my mind when I go around to the exporter exporters in Louisiana. I say, what do you need to create more American jobs? They say more robust markets to export to. Right now, Japan and Europe are in the doldrums. We need those economies to do better so we can create more American jobs. So is it fair to say, let me ask, at the World Economic Summit, what is the prognosis for the Japanese economy as an example if they cannot replace their nuclear capability with some reasonable? Well, they've turned, uh, I mean, with the new government in Japan is going to reconsider, and I think in July it's going to come out with its policy about whether it's going to keep some of the plants operating or not. With that said, the Japanese are kind of in a panic about energy supplies right now. Uh, very focused on uh, LNG as their kind of major increment. And I think the point you say, a Japanese economy that's a, a weak economy uh, is part of a global economy and contributes to global weakness. So we're pretty interdependent with them. That's why I said they're, you know, they're a close ally, and, and uh, if they do well, we, we do better. It is in our self-interest to make sure that they have adequate energy supply. That's right, and it's, all, it's in our uh, political interest, and it's in our economic interest. Okay, sounds great. Uh, Ms. Morgan, you spoke about methane emissions. I think it's important to make sure the record is straight. A lot of times folks uh, who are critical of natural gas uh, state that the, um, st quote that Cornell study, Mr. Howarth's study, in which finds very high levels of methane 
release with natural gas production. But just to set the record straight, that's kind of an outlier study, isn't it? I mean, both the uh, Department of Energy as well as an MIT peer-reviewed study have found uh, a tenth of the emissions as the Howarth study. Is that a fair statement? We're actually in the process of putting out a study on this. We think that there, that study is on the upper end. Uh, the Howarth study is on the upper end. Yep. Yeah. And, uh, but that there are also real measures that can be put in place to control methane, even on the lower level, that are important. Mr. Jurgen? Yeah, just to add, I know my colleagues, uh, the Howard study used uh, data that uh, supposedly came from us, and my colleagues had written a letter to the journal, which was published, saying the data had been quite uh, uh, distorted. Hmm. Uh, and there is now a cooperative program with the Environmental Defense Fund and a number of companies to actually measure methane and come out with some uh, hard data on it. I just say that because, Ms. Morgan, your testimony suggested that the life cycle carbon release of natural gas is not as favorable as we would presume, but that really seems to assume the HOAR study is valid, and frankly, there seems to be a general agreement that it is not. I think even on the lower levels, uh, it is important to put in place measures to, to deal well, with I'm not that. Well, I'm not arguing that. Right. I'm just saying the life cycle release has been overstated. The life cycle as a whole, that study does overstate it. Yeah. Uh, okay. I, I yield back. Thank you. The gentleman's time has expired. The gentlelady from Florida, Ms. Castor. Good morning, and thank you very much for your uh, insightful testimony. The uh, outlook from the Energy Information Agency is very positive for the economy, and I think beyond the current outlook, there is great potential for additional economic growth tied to domestic supplies. Uh, if we have the appropriate environmental safeguards, and I think uh, here in America, we can do more for consumers and uh, for electric uh, reliability or reliability from all energy sources. But in order to build that more sustainable energy system, we need to bring greater balance between fossil fuels and renewable sources. And I don't think it's all about generating energy from cleaner sources. We also need to make our economy more efficient so that we use less energy overall. And I think that it may be time to look at the business models for utilities and the incentives and modernizing those business models. Uh, according to the IEA, energy efficiency is an enormous unrealized opportunity for the world to reduce energy use and thereby carbon pollution. The IEA uh, projects that two-thirds of potential efficiency gains will remain untapped through 2035 under current policies. That's a real hit on the pocketbooks of American families and businesses. Uh, Ms. Morgan, in your testimony, you say the United States has immense remaining potential for improving efficiency in its industrial, transportation, and building sectors. Which energy efficiency measures uh, have the most potential to reduce energy consumption from uh, the U.S. Uh, industrial sector? I think there are a number of different measures, and they can, they can come in on either a state level or on a national level. There's tremendous potential of combined heat and power on the state level for industrial facilities. Uh, in uh, the building sector, certainly also you look at both the uh, opportunity for um, new business models, but also for jobs in retrofitting buildings. There's great potential there. Uh, and certainly, you know, the, the evidence base is quite strong if you look at the benefits that have come from the new car standards uh, that have been put in place. Can you give me some more specific examples of or the most innovative energy measures in use today? Are there, en are there energy efficiency measures being implemented uh, at the state level or abroad that uh, we, should be, we should expand or employ on a national level? There's a program um, actually in Germany that is very focused on the retrofitting of buildings. Uh, and there you need, need very clearly to look at the ownership structure, obviously. But they're looking at how you can get at the point that the owner and the renter don't always share the benefits and looking at new models of how they can uh, put in place measures to retrofit those buildings extensively across the country. They are funding that actually with revenue from uh, their emissions trading system, uh, so it's uh, not additional funding uh, coming in. I, I think that's a very strong example. You actually have a very strong uh, program in China around their enterprises as well, where they're putting in place uh, measures to, to share practices and uh, set targets for companies to increase their efficiency. And in your written testimony, you state that the federal government can play an important role in improving energy efficiency across the economy. You said 
Uh, the first step is to support programs that ensure consumers can make to, make informed choices. What what were you talking about? What what else can the Congress do to encourage consumers to make energy efficient choices in the marketplace? Well, I think there's things like um, smart metering. Uh, information provided both in, in all products that is uh, much clearer about energy saved, money saved, CO2 saved. Uh, there's ways when you start looking at our grid on the smart metering side of things. I think if, if consumers, first of all, have more information, but then also, you know, uh, can be able to buy the top runner products as, as affordably as possible, then those are good. Wouldn't it help if then the electric utilities really had an incentive to promote conservation and greater efficiency. They would help empower consumers uh, to do that. It would be a win for families. They'd have more money uh, to spend at home, and, and the utilities would, uh, the, their business would change a little bit. For example, in, in my neck of the woods, we have this terrible debacle with a broken nuclear power plant, and it is enormously expensive. And we like the diversity in power supply. It's very important. But it seems now that we'd get more bang for the buck if we helped save energy and the utility had some incentive. Where is that happening? It's Are those discussions happening? Yeah, they're happening somewhat on the state level, I think, in certain states where you have these kind of demand-side management models that are put together where both utilities and consumers benefit. I think they need to be much more broadened out so that they occur uh, across the country more systematically. Do any of you have information on those kind of incentives or changing the business model? I, I could just add very quickly that uh, the lighting standards that have been put in place starting this year, uh, changes in appliance efficiency, the improvements in auto fuel efficiency, uh, lower vehicle miles traveled, all of that is leading to lower energy use per capita, which uh, is, is, a, is uh, good. You're getting uh, more value for for less consumption. Uh, in the, the quickly, the difference between the new auto fuel efficiency standards that got adopted last year, so between 2012 and 2013 and our forecasts, uh, by the year 2035, that's worth something like one and a half million barrels a day of oil imports. Thank you very much. Gentlelady's time's expired. The gentleman from Texas, Mr. Olson. I thank the chair and welcome to the witnesses. I thank you for your time and expertise as we lay the groundwork for a broader discussion about federal energy policy and the importance of a robust domestic energy industry. I want to dig a little deeper into the geopolitical challenges we're facing in the new energy era. As we move forward as a nation, we need to better understand how our newly realized energy resources can advance our foreign policy goals. One historic example of how U.S. energy production or a lack thereof, impacts the geopolitical landscape, the Persian Gulf. At the end of World War II, our geopolitical focus was on containing communism. When I joined the Navy in 1989, we had four numbered fleets, the second fleet in the Atlantic, the sixth fleet in the Mediterranean Sea, the third fleet in the Eastern Pacific, and the seventh fleet in the Western Pacific in Japan. Communism fell in 1991, and as a result, our global military forces changed dramatically. We added the fifth fleet in the Persian Gulf. We disestablished the second fleet in the Western Pacific in September of 2011. And the seventh fleet has now become the largest fleet in our, in our Navy, and it's ramping up very quickly with China's aggression in the South China Sea. American innovation and our abundant energy resources can and should be leveraged to protect our allies around the world from unreliable and unfriendly regimes and promote our interests. Another example of how U.S. energy supply can strengthen our relationships with important countries is India. They have the world's largest democracy, and they're in a pretty unreliable neighborhood. They got Pakistan to the west, China to the north, Bangladesh to the east. I had lunch with the Indian Council General in Houston a couple weeks ago. We spoke for 20 minutes about India getting U.S. Uh, compressed LNG, export natural gas to India. Right now, they've got a big problem. They have no pipelines. Because they're neighbors, they can't have overland pipelines. So all of their energy supply has to come in the form of oil and gas, has to come either via train 
or via boat, mostly boat. They want to be our partner. And so my question for you, Dr. Jurgen, in your view, how can our energy resources, energy resource base reshape our foreign policy objectives? What countries do we develop our strength and our ties with? And how can we pressure rogue states without relying on military intervention? Well, that's, that's a big question. I think that first we are seeing, as we've been describing, a rebalancing of global oil that's occurring, and that we'll see the Western Hemisphere largely uh, self-sufficient in years to come, and more of the oil from the Middle East going to the, to, to the Far East. So I think that's kind of one of the fundamental changes. I think what you refer to with India, I found when I was in Asia recently, in Singapore and other countries, also that interest in seeing uh, the U.S. as a, at least a player as an energy exporter, if not a massive one, uh, because for them it's diversification and uh, they'd like to actually be more reliant uh, and diversified to more to depend upon the United States. I think as these technologies uh, develop and we see uh, it, it develop elsewhere, I mean, a key country actually is what Mexico does in terms of uh, opening itself up to these new technologies is something that I think is like right on the foreground. In terms of new relationships, um, Brazil is on course to be a, a global energy powerhouse, and I think the U.S.-Brazilian relationship is one that uh, grows, in, uh, grows in significance for us. So those would be some of the changes. How about Eastern Europe, who buys their natural gas largely from Russia? Well, uh, Poland is very interested in, uh, it's interesting, you have different mixes in Europe as, uh, on policy. Uh, Poland certainly wants to develop uh, its shale gas to reduce its dependence on Russian gas. And Ukraine, of course, is constant friction between Russia and Ukraine over the price of natural gas. And Ukraine, I think just last week or the week before, uh, started signing some large agreements to develop shale gas in Ukraine, and for them, it's not only economic, but it's also a geopolitical development. Uh, I get emails back home every week from people along the Silk Road, you know, where Turkey starts and runs sort of heads, heads east towards all into India, all those countries right there, the former Soviet states up there on the Caspian Sea, they want our natural gas. So again, I think it's a great opportunity for our country to actually have an influence with these people, make some friends, create American jobs. And again, well, and I think they want, and they want to be integrated in the global markets as a way to sustain their, their nationhood. Yes, sir. Well, it looks like I'm out of time. I yield back the balance of my time. Thank you. This time I recognize the gentleman from Pennsylvania, Mr. Dolow, five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and, and thank you to our witnesses today. Uh, this morning we're discussing a uh, new landscape for North America's uh, energy resources and how we develop a, an effective energy policy in the absence of uh, resource scarcity. Uh, in my home state of Western uh, Pennsylvania, especially in Western Pennsylvania, where I represent, uh, we're experiencing a surge in energy development that each of you have discussed in your testimony. Uh, in my neck of the woods, we have natural gas, coal, nuclear. We've got steel workers making wind turbines. We've got universities producing energy startups that are harnessing renewables. Marcella Shell alone in my state has provided thousands of new jobs, and uh, we're burning a cleaner fuel. Uh, for our transportation and electric industry. So it's important to me uh, that policymakers fully understand energy reserves that we have and, and the best ways to uh, develop them. But something that's equally important to me is how we manage the effects of carbon emissions that come from burning these resources. I've worked many years on this committee. This is my 13th year on the committee and the 19th year in Congress uh, to do this in a comprehensive way. And I think most of the members of this committee knows that I want to get our fossil fuel resources out of the ground. Uh, I don't think it has to be an either or proposition. But what I'm interested in is how we find that sweet spot where we can develop North American energy resources and effectively manage our carbon emissions simultaneously. So I, I have some questions about that. But before I ask those questions, I just want to provide some clarity to something that we heard at this hearing and we hear a lot. Uh, my good friend, Mr. Scalise, and he is my good friend, uh, had asked Ms. Uh, Hutzler uh, why we weren't seeing more development on federal lands, and, and her reply was that the permitting process takes up to 300 days. Uh, I want to put a map up on the screen that I think we have uh, that I think should provide a little bit of clarity. As you look at the United States, uh, that dark area, the gray shaded area, that, that's the federal lands and the, the, the light red, the pinkish area, is where our oil and gas shell plays are. And then the dark red that you see is where there's an overlap of federal lands and oil and gas shell plays. 
And uh, Mr. Siminski, I think back in August, uh, you testified to this committee uh, that because basically the shell resource basins are largely outside of the federal lands, so too is the shell production. Uh, I think your quote was, in this case, the geology is working in favor of, of non-federal landowners. So uh, we hear this a lot that, you know, there's all this development that could be taking place on federal lands, but the permitting process is, is so bad. And I think the map pretty graphically illustrates that there's just not much federal lands where the oil and gas shell plays are in the United States. Um, I just wanted to provide that for clarification. I want to ask Dr. Jurgen uh, and, and, and Ms. Hutzler, too, you both briefly addressed climate change and greenhouse gases in your written testimonies. And uh, I just wonder, as we start to reassess these vast new energy resources, and, it, and it's not that they're new, it's, it's we find, you know, technology has given us a way to make them economically feasible to go and recover them now, right? And everything we do is, is a technology question, uh, whether it's uh, how we dispose of nuclear waste, uh, what do we do with carbon emissions, just all of this, the answer's in technologies, and, and we're discovering new ways to do things in a more environmentally sound way. We hear about new types of fracking fluids uh, because there's this tremendous potential to get this out of the ground. And I guess my question is, is don't you, I, I, I'm interested to hear, do you believe that we should also factor in uh, climate change and these environmental concerns? Because it seems to me that, that once industries and, and uh, uh, you know, have to address these carbon issues too, uh, we're gonna see technology innovations there also uh, that are going to be very valuable to U.S. companies to help these uh, uh, non-economic, these economies like in China and India and others, they're not going to be the leaders in figuring out how to deal with carbon emissions. That's going to that's going to hopefully come here, and then we're going to sell that technology all over the world. So I guess what I want to ask you is, do you think we should factor this in as we're looking at a, a new energy policy and, and these new fuels factoring in environmental concerns and climate change as we develop policy? I think we're certainly uh, factoring them in. I, as I said, I spent some time on that Secretary of Energy Advisory Board uh, committee that I think provided a framework for looking at the environmental questions and saying, how do you address them? Uh, and it's, there's climate change, but there's also the water questions. What do you do about wastewater? Questions that you know very well from your, your district that need to be addressed. I think that uh, as uh, we've just discussed, the uh, understanding the methane emissions from uh, from natural gas drilling is a very important contribution to it. There are different views as to what the results will be. And I'd say that the other thing is that you have to see this in an entirety. It's not that we're going to use more oil because we're producing oil, but it means a our cars, as Adam says, are going to get a lot more efficient as we do it. But the question is, is that oil going to be produced in the United States or are we going to import it? So we have to see it in a framework. I want to address your map again, and maybe that is the case for the shale uh, formations. But on the other hand, the federal government has a lot of non-shale based areas that it but, could but be all the permitting. growth is in the sh I mean the boom we're seeing right now is is happening because we figured out how to get this oil and gas out of shale. Well, let's take the offshore area in terms of oil drilling. We were uh, drilling a lot. As a matter of fact, the oil numbers offshore in FY 2010 were very high. But then it <clears throat> dropped by 17 percent. So you can still get a lot of oil offshore if you allow the permitting to go on. Yeah, I, I, the point I want, we, we're seeing this huge boom in oil and, and gas shell, and, and it basically exists on non-federal land. So I just think it's somewhat of a red herring. Gentlemen, it's time. Chairman, I see my time's up. Uh, this time I recognize the gentleman from Colorado, Mr. Gardner, for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thank you to the witnesses for showing today. And if I could have that last slide put up on the screen again, that would be fantastic. If you look at the state of Colorado as it appears on the map that uh, is right there, you can see the state of Colorado. That red spot is in my district in northern Colorado. But there's tremendous opportunity for development in the gray spots. Uh, and a lot of that gray spot that you see in Colorado or the Rocky Mountain areas, uh, it's BLM land, it's U.S. Forest Service land, uh, they're unable to get permits through the BLM uh, because of various uh, bureaucracies. In fact, according to the Western Energy Alliance, over 100,000 jobs could be created in the Western United States, primarily on those gray lands, if the permitting delays were simply lifted. Over 100,000 jobs could be created in the western United States. That's not because all the development's taken place in the red areas or the pink areas. That's because the, the Bureau of Land Management and other agencies have 
been so slow in their permitting that we can't get those permits through to create those kinds of jobs. So uh, I, I think you'd see a lot more red areas if we could actually get a government that was willing to allow us access to those resources in a responsible manner. And so I, for one, would like to see over 100,000 jobs being created in the Western United States. Uh, but I'd also like to, to ask a couple of other questions, uh, pointing out that in that red area, you see in northern Colorado right there, uh, because of that development that's taking place in that play, there was an article in the Greeley Tribune on January 17th that said, uh, the Greeley Tribune's the newspaper in northern Colorado that said, uh, Weld County rose 20 spots in, the, in a year to rank number 42 in the nation in job and wage growth. There was an article in the same newspaper, January 8th of 2013, that said, Weld County wages, wage growth hits number five in the nation because of, uh, in great part, the energy development that's taking place in Colorado. So we can see the opportunities, and I believe it was Ms. Hutzler that talked about the amount of economic impact that we have seen. Uh, I think your statement, what was it again that you said about the trillion dollars over 30 years? Uh, how, how, what was the amount of money you said as a result of development? Uh, if we opened up new areas onshore and offshore to uh, development that we would get over the next 37 years, $14.4 trillion to the economy. And I believe the President's budget said that if we had, uh, and I'm going to get this, this number in the ballpark, uh, if we had 1 percent GDP growth over the next 10 years, we would generate around $2 billion or so in new revenues for the federal government. And so you can see the kind of activity that GDP growth uh, we would see, the kind of GDP growth we would see as a result of, of energy development across the country. Ms. Hutzler, uh, what, you mentioned the permitting delays on federal land. What do we need to do in order to alleviate those delays? We need to make the process more streamlined. We need to get rid of all the ta red tape and the delays and look at the states to see how they're doing it to um, to remove those delays, or in fact, allow the states to uh, actually do the permitting, because they certainly know the geologic areas and what's best for the state. Uh, Ms. Morgan, you had said something in, in, in your statement regarding uh, 2050 carbon emissions. Is that the getting reducing carbon emissions by 80 percent by 2050? Uh, 20 percent of today's carbon emissions would be what about a billion dollars? Excuse me, a billion tons of CO2. Is that roughly what it would be if? That's roughly, yeah. Okay. What, can you give me an, an emissions inventory of, uh, for 2050 of specific sources that would add, to, add up to 1 billion tons in CO2? In 2050? Yeah. A specific inventory of emissions. Well, I can, I can certainly, I mean... Does the technology exist today to, oh, to do that? question. Yes, it does exist today. The National Renewable Energy Laboratory actually said you can get to the 80 percent renewables by 2050 with existing technologies. What the inventory would be then would, would be much less CO2. There would probably be a bit left over in some of the non-CO2 gases. But the, the point is, is that I think if we were to build out and put in place the policies, you can find that sweet spot uh, of extracting our clean energy resources while also uh, producing the gas in a more climate-friendly fashion. And I think that's something that I have long been supportive of, is an effort to find a, a sweet spot when it comes to both renewable alternative energy sources as well as traditional energy sources. But unfortunately, what I, what I see in Colorado, what I see out of this administration are attempts to actually make it more difficult to develop that traditional resource. In fact, I was reading a letter from uh, one of the EPA regions, I believe it was Region 3 of the EPA, uh, concerning an LNG export facility that they were asking how many new wells would have to be drilled across the country uh, as a result of that one single LNG facility. And I think when we start asking those kinds of questions, what happens to this LNG facility uh, to wells being drilled in Colorado, that seems to me to be a very adverse uh, tone for energy production in this nation. And uh, I see my time's expired, and I'll yield back. This time I recognize the gentleman from New York, Mr. Tonko, for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, and thank you to the witnesses for uh, presenting this uh, at this hearing. Um, there's been a lot of discussion about the oil and gas production and the expanded estimates of uh, domestic oil and gas reserves. Um, we actually, and uh, I believe there's most likely this gap between proven and technically recoverable recoverable uh, reserves. Um, to what degree, if any? Have the environmental costs of, of um, exploiting oil and gas been considered in estimating the technically recoverable reserves? 
Anyone? I can I can try to address that issue. Um, in the work that um, that we've done, we've uh, defined the technically recoverable to be uh, based on current technology and current activity. So we apply a, a factor of so many uh, BCF or so many barrels per well based on what's going on right now. So it does not take into account future changes to regulations that might change the cost. However, when we look at the economically recoverable resource base, which is a subset of the technically recoverable, we have to make certain assumptions about the costs. So depending upon what kind of scenario we're looking at, we may use today's cost, which are based on today's environmental rules, or we may hypothesize new regulations that might be imposed in the future. And typically when we look at that, we would look at a series of different rules about water use, uh, different types of materials that can be used, and so on. Generally when we've looked at that, we would say that the future uh, regulations might add something like 7% to the cost of a well. So that would produce then a, a resource cost that would be about 7% higher than today's cost. But of course that depends on what regulations are implemented in the future. Anyone else? Uh, many of you did not respond, so I'm assuming there was no environmental cost. Uh, Ms. Morgan. Yes, sir. I just, um, I believe that environmental costs are actually not factored in, and we'd be happy to provide data from a recent National Academy of Sciences report on the climate and non-climate impacts that has a U.S. focus, right. for the record. Um, well, I, I mean, the environmental, I mean, if, if the environmental costs, if you mean, for instance, regulations that require about how you manage water, uh, how you manage land, uh, how you manage air quality, those are all environmental costs that are then internalized because they're part of the regulatory process. Uh, well, Dr. Yergin, you discussed the implications of the expansion um, in gas production uh, for our domestic markets and for the global market. Um, the demand in the U.S. has leveled out recently, uh, but global oil consumption continues to expand and fossil fuel use continues to expand. How does that, how do the rates of um, increase in our reserves compare to the rate of increase in oil and gas consumption uh, globally? Globally, the world's now divided into two. There's uh, the OECD, the U.S., Western Europe, Japan, where we really started in about 2005, 2007 to have peak demand in terms of oil, and our oil consumption is going to go down, not up, because, as Adam said, more efficient cars, because of demographic changes in our population, uh, because people reach a limit to how many hours they want to spend sitting in a car. Uh, so I think that's happening. But the great boom is, of course, in the emerging markets. And uh, they're roughly now consume about half, about the same amount of oil as the uh, advanced markets. But that's where all the growth is, is going to be. China in 2000 sold 2 million new cars. We sold 17 million new cars. By 2010, we were selling 12 million new cars and they were selling 17 million. So that tells you where the growth is going to be. And the, um, the experiencing this period of relative abundance, uh, but we've been there before in our recent past history. So oil and gas markets are volatile and have led us to a false sense of uh, energy security in the past. So how do, we, how do we develop a national energy policy that is less sh uh, short-sighted and more strategic? And uh, basically, how can we best use these reserves to maximized um, well, I think you're, benefit. I think you're, I mean, what you said is quite right, that we've seen, after all, this is just a development of the last three or four years, and we were focused in this discussion on our resource base, but look at the Middle East. I mean, the, the people used to talk about the arc of instability going from Syria to Iran. Uh, now they talk about it going from the Sahel in Africa uh, to Central Asia. So we're, I mean, you look at the map, and there are many parts of the world where, which have abundant energy supplies, but th where there's a lot of uh, ev very evident political risk. And so I think your point that we shouldn't, there's no reason here for complacency. Yeah. Ms. Morgan, you were going to I, I just wanted to say that I think that if you look, lo that the, we really can uh, pull out all, all of our resources, that we don't need to be thinking of an either or. 
and that renewable energy resources, energy efficiency, and CCS are all part of that, and you need to take that longer-term view or else we'll be making short-sighted decisions and not building the CCS in now onto our gas and oil uh, decisions. Thank you very much. Uh, that I yield back. Thank you very much. At uh, this time, I recognize the gentleman from Virginia, Mr. Griffith, for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, I, I would have to say I think we have to uh, use all of our energy resources to develop a plan long term. That being said, in regard to natural gas, uh, Administrator Siminski, uh, you would expect at some point in the next few years for gas to return to $4. Uh, is that correct? We have uh, natural gas prices getting back to $4 a million BTUs by the end of next year. Okay. And in fact, they've been going up and they hit a low in April of, of $1.95 and in December they were at three thirty four. Is that correct? I believe so, sir. And uh, if I understood your testimony earlier, when it gets to $4, uh, coal becomes very competitive again? It's it's a sliding scale, but uh, as natural gas prices go higher, coal becomes more attractive. I appreciate that very much coming from a coal district, and, then, and I will turn to <laughs> you, Ms. Uh, Hutzler. Um, a lot of what we've been doing has been ignoring uh, coal and its potential as a major resource in this country. It's, it's always been that way. And uh, I would point out that I think in your testimony you said that uh, we've relied on three major sources. Of course, we've got our renewables, but we also our three major sources are nuclear, coal, and natural gas. Is that correct? Yes. Mm -hmm. And uh, I think you also reported that uh, just the Mercury Utility Mac rules would uh, cost about $21 billion a year and $183,000 183, jobs a year. Is that correct? Yes. And that uh, retirement of coal power plants, uh, we're, by tw 2016, we're going to be retiring 27 gigawatts. Is that also accurate? I think that's through 2015, and that's an EIA number that's been reported to them by electric utility companies. All right. And that's much higher than the EPA's estimates when they first came out with this uh, new regulation. Isn't that correct? Yes. Mm -hmm. And uh, and in fact, not only is it going to affect uh, jobs in the coal fields and at coal-powered uh, at coal fired power plants, but it also will cause our electric rates to go up by 10 to 20 percent in most of the country. Isn't that correct? Yes. Mm -hmm. And in fact, in some parts in the Midwest, not, I don't represent them, but in some parts it could be right up there at the 20 percent. Mm -hmm. Yes, in states that are highly dependent on coal fired generation. Now, you acknowledge in, in your written testimony that uh, that the EPA claims that they're not going to do this, but you do raise some concern and worry that the EPA may decide that the uh, modifications in regard to greenhouse gases could impact existing coal-fired power plants because that would force them to, uh, if they interpreted that uh, complying with Utility Act created them to, uh, into a new source, new source, that that would then uh, put a tremendous amount of pressure on the existing <coughs> Uh, coal-fired power plants and cause even more closures. Is that correct? Yes, because uh, under the utility MAC rule, if there are substantial changes, they might be able to look at that particular unit as a new unit and therefore um, treat it as a new unit where they don't want the amount of uh, greenhouse gas emissions to be any more than from a natural gas plant, essentially. And you cited uh, a report from the United Mine Workers of America that would indicate that if that were to happen, that job losses uh, could amount to more than 50,000 direct jobs if you count coal utilities and the, and the uh, railroad industry, uh, and uh, as much as 250,000 jobs indirect. Is that a correct assessment of what the UMWA said? Yes. Mm -hmm. All right. So this is of great concern in my area because we have railroads, coal, and, and utility companies. Um, I would point out also that it's kind of interesting that uh, your your written testimony indicates that the Chinese are using about four times as, as much coal as we are, and that while they're building cleaner plants, they're not putting their older, uh, less clean plants uh, out of existence in the meantime, are they? No, they're not. With their GDP growth, they need all the power they can get. And in fact, according to the uh, National Energy Technology Laboratory, they're building 60 to 80 gigawatts of coal-fired plants a year, and they think that'll happen easily through 2016 and maybe further. And so they're, they're relying on coal, including maybe even some of our coal, to generate their uh, energy and the growth in their economy. Isn't that true? Yes, they have to import coal now. They can't produce enough themselves to satisfy their demand, and we are exporting coal to them. 
And so when I tell my constituents that not only are we damaging coal, but we're also damaging jobs in the United States, we're allowing the Chinese to grow their economy by, while retarding our economy by not using our clean coal technology. Isn't that correct? Yes. Mm -hmm. And in fact, in, in my district, there's a plant that just opened this year that's extremely clean. And because of the carbon uh, uh, rules, uh, the greenhouse gas rules, it wouldn't be allowed to be built if it hadn't already uh, been under construction and then opened this year. Isn't that correct? Mm -hmm. And so for all intents and purposes, at least at this point in history, there's not the technology available for the United States to build any more clean coal plants, coal-fired uh, electric generation plants, and we're really handicapping ourselves in relationship to our competitiveness with the Chinese. Isn't that also true? Yes, we don't. Currently, CCS technology is not available, commercially available for these plants. Mm -hmm. All right, I thank you, and I yield back, Mr. Chairman. This time I recognize the senator, I mean, the, the honorable gentleman from Massachusetts, <laughs> Mr. Markey, for five minutes. I thank you. I thank the gentleman very much. Um, just a point. In 2009, in this committee and on the House floor, Mr. Waxman and I built in $60 billion for clean coal technology, carbon capture and sequestration. We voted it out of this committee with no Republican support. Uh, over the last five years, unfortunately, coal has dropped from 51 percent down to 35 percent of all electrical generation in the country, and what has gone up? Natural gas. It's less expensive and it's cleaner. So coal is being attacked, but it's by the natural gas industry. So let's just get that clear. And we put the $60 billion in, and the coal industry opposed the waxman marquee bill. They opposed it. Now they suffer from not having the investment in technology to make it cleaner. So don't blame us, okay? Blame the coal industry for not wanting the funding. And uh, blame, the coal, blame the natural gas industry for their technological breakthroughs. Uh, which have allowed for the production of more and uh, cheaper and cleaner uh, source of energy. Mr. Um, Siminski, recently the Department of Energy released a study of the economic import, uh, impacts associated with exporting large quantities of natural gas that was performed by NERA Consulting. <clears throat> the study used outdated 2010 EIA projection data and concluded that while exports would lead to higher domestic energy prices and adverse impacts to American manufacturing, the overall economic impact would be positive. Mr. Semensky, isn't it true that EIA's 2010 data predicted that domestic natural gas used in the power sector would decline between 10, 2010 and 2020, uh, though its use in the power sector has actually ended up growing by 27 percent just since 2010? Uh, I've been in the forecasting business for a long time. No, I'm just asking, is that true or not? I'm not asking it's, for your personal history. It's, uh, yes. We, yes, okay, that's all you need to know. Yes, so way off. EIA was way off. It not only natural gas in the utility sector not only did not go down, it's now gone up 27% since that report. Isn't it true that EIA's current projections of natural gas use in the transportation sector are seven times as high as the 2010 data used in the NERA study. And our supply estimates are also higher. I'm only, I'm not asking you, I'm asking you to just go back to this study that is being relied upon. Is it not seven times higher in the transportation sector than NERA projected in just 2010? Yes, sir. Okay, thank you. So this data was released in 2010, um, and uh, since then, 100 major manufacturing projects totaling $95 billion in investment have been announced. <clears throat> These are manufacturing facilities that would produce chemicals, fertilizer, steel, aluminum, glass, tires, plastics, and other goods, all of which rely on cheap natural gas. That's what's driving this manufacturing. These announced projects alone would push U.S. industrial demand for natural gas 30 percent beyond the estimates used in the NERA study. Just yesterday, the Wall Street Journal described decisions made by German and Canadian companies to locate new facilities in the United States because of low natural gas prices. The Germans, the Canadians, are coming to the United States with their manufacturing facilities. Do you believe that we should be making decisions about what to do with domestic natural gas in 2013 and beyond using data that reflected what was going on in that sector three years ago that vastly underestimated what is happening today. I think it's always better to have 
recent and accurate data in making forecasts, but... Uh, Especially since the data we're talking about is like a Frankie Avalon record, except it only took three years to turn it into completely outdated information that, is, that was totally wrong about where we'd be three years later. Um, Congressman not 30, Markey, not as, later. Let me as just I continue. was trying to say earlier... Let me just continue. Could I last, year, your your, question, la last year, your agency found that exporting 12 billion cubic feet per day of natural gas could lead to a 54 percent increase in domestic prices. But today, companies are applying to export nearly three times that amount. <clears throat> it seems to me that before we permit more natural gas exports to occur, we should have an understanding of the potential economic impacts on consumers, on the manufacturing sector, and on the transportation sector in the United States in terms of our own internal domestic growth in those uh, sectors of our economy um, uh, and have it based upon real data, not old data, that bears no resemblance to what is happening in the natural uh, gas uh, sector today. Now, let me just uh, ask this question. Uh, this panel, led by the Republicans, voted this in 2012 to repeal the ability of EPA to increase fuel economy standards for the vehicles which we drive. Um, let me just go down the line here and just ask each of you, do you support um, the repeal of the ability of the EPA uh, to increase fuel economy standards, or do you oppose uh, repealing the authority? Can we just go down and we just get your views on that way in which we deal with oil consumption in the United States? Mr. Semensky. It's not a question for me, Congressman. It's not? No, it's not. It's a policy issue. Okay, good. Mr. Jurgen. I think fuel efficiency standards are an important contribution to uh, energy efficiency in our overall energy mix. Thank you. I agree. It's a great example of how you can meet energy and climate security goals at the same time. Good. Thank you. Uh, well, they're important and certainly make a difference. You have to take a look at... No, just that uh, one issue. One issue, please. Well, there's, yes. there's safety issues with vehicles and other issues that have so to be taken would, into account. So you would, you would consider repealing EPA authority? I, uh, I would think that it needs to study and you have to look okay. at a balanced right. situation. So uh, yes. yes, sir. Um, I, I don't want to state any policy decision uh, uh, opinions like that, but as a personal consumer of cars, I certainly like to have more efficient cars. Okay. Gen thank gentleman's you. time is expired. Okay, thank you. This time, recognize the gentleman from uh, Illinois, Mr. Kinzinger. Well, thank you, Mr. Chairman, and, and thank you all for coming in. Just a couple of questions, and uh, this may not take all my five minutes. Uh, Mr. Jurgen, uh, last uh, week's Wall Street Journal, there was an article titled, uh, Can Gas Undo Nuclear Power? Um, discuss how low natural gas prices is problematic for our baseload energy production. And uh, I'd like to know your thoughts on low gas prices as it impacts fuel diversity into the future and existing domestic resources like nuclear. I think what's happened with uh, natural gas prices, remember when people went out to start developing shale gas, it was, the incentive was very great for these independents. It was like $12, and now we know we're talking around $3, and that is really changing the marketplace, uh, the electric power marketplace for everything, uh, certainly including, uh, including nuclear. So does that give you uh, concerns for maybe the viability of nuclear in the future if this continues? And, and also, what do you think this is going to do uh, do, do you think in 10 years, if you can magically look forward, that we'll have a diverse energy supplier? Do you think we'll, uh, we'll, we'll maybe be kind of too many eggs in one basket? Well, I think it's the, um, we have four reactors that are under construction, two projects now. I think that in this cost environment, it's, you, it's very hard to see anybody committing to a current generation of new power plants. The Secretary of Energy Advisory Board uh, the last session was partly devoted to uh, small modular nuclear reactors, in other words, where there's a technological innovation. And I think the other question about our nuclear fleet is uh, it's about 20 percent of our electricity. Lives have been extended. What happens after another 20 years, and does that shrink away then? Yeah. Uh, and then a, another a question. You mentioned my home state of Illinois as a state that already employs 39,000 people in oil and gas. Well, uh, it, it, who are benefiting from the unconventional oil and gas revolution. Right. Although that Illinois hasn't yet uh, passed the regulation. No, we, it's about time we get there. <laughs> yeah. but, uh, what would the economic impact be on Illinois if they allowed oil and gas production in your mind? Well, they, as far as new, yeah, a new, uh, it would be, uh, it would lead to a considerable uh, uh, generation of income in the state, as we've seen in, in other states. Mr. Doyle mentioned it in, in his state. 
And uh, when I was out in, your, uh, in Illinois, I, that day the front page of uh, USA Today was about how income is shifting, new income is being created in areas that, rural areas, areas that had been depopulated and so forth because of this activity and kind of in the center of the state. And, the and they're the areas that are frankly suffering sometimes the hardest under this recession, yeah. under this economic difficulty, we'll call it, to avoid argument on it. Yeah, um, so the new Albany Shale could be very important for the economy of your state. And uh, at what price do you think natural gas would need to be in order to, uh, for production to occur in Illinois? Well, I think it's really, uh, I mean, I think uh, it's, people are ready to go ahead. It depends upon what uh, happens in Springfield, I think, as to whether it goes ahead or not and uh, at what uh, speed. I'll say Springfield makes Washington, D.C. look highly functional. So, okay. <laughs> um, well, thank you. And I think uh, I appreciate your, you know, everybody's testimony. I appreciate your answering my questions. The big concern here into the future is uh, I've always been a believer in saying you can't have too few energy supplies. And, and when it comes specifically to, to nuclear, I think it's important we ensure nuclear maintain a major part of our uh, energy uh, portfolio because in the future you never know how things change. But uh, with that, I want to say thank you. Thank you, Mr. Yeah. Chairman. I'll yield back. This time I recognize uh, Mr. Pompeo for five minutes from Kansas. <laughs> Great. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thanks, witnesses, for that. It's been a long morning. I think we're, I think I'm in cleanup today. Uh, a couple thoughts. It's been great to listen to. I've heard words like renaissance and revolution thrown around and um, all the good things are happening. I think it's worth noting for everyone here, um, almost all of that happened with almost zero role of the federal government. Um, most of the things that the federal government's resources have gone to in this intervening period between this hearing in 2008 and the one in 2013 uh, continue to provide a very, very negligible uh, set of outputs important to the American economy. And so I think that, um, I think that suggests the direction of travel for us as well. Um, as we think about new policies. Uh, Mr. Jurgen, I've got a question for you about pipelines. Mr. Shimk has talked about it a little bit. Uh, you know, there's an article in Energy Daily talking about um, uh, how long it's taking for permitting. I'd like to introduce that article into the record, if I might, Mr. Chairman. Not uh, study found that nearly 20% of natural gas pipelines uh, have delays of over six months or more. Uh, enormous capital at risk when you think about building a new pipeline. Um, and it's important not only for existing fields to get those pipelines. Uh, the Mississippi Shale in my district is a good example. Uh, we've got production, but relatively little demand in towns like Anthony and Coldwater, Kansas. Got to get this product to the right places. Uh, I think there's also a circular effect. That right is if you build, if you know that you can efficiently build a pipeline, folks will go look for it in other places as well. Can you talk about the interplay between challenges in building pipelines and people's willingness to take risk in finding these fields in North America? Well, I think uh, Ms. Hutzler sp uh, spoke about that before, too. Uh, I think that uh, getting that, that the, the word she used, streamlining uh, permitting for pipelines, I mean, it's kind of pipelines are literally a pretty straightforward thing, and that we ought to, uh, that you need them to keep up with where we are, and otherwise you either are using flaring for gas or you're shipping uh, oil by truck and so forth, and that's not a very uh, efficient way to do it. I appreciate that. I'm actually going to, I'm working on some legislation to give FERC a little more authority in trying to streamline this process. I think it'll be bipartisan. I think we can do this in a way that provides all the protections for the environment, all the things we need to do, uh, but getting us to a finish line where we actually make decisions about these, whether the, the pipeline's a go or a no-go, we do it in a very much more timely uh, and reliable fashion. Uh, we've talked a lot about energy exports. I was surprised Mr. Griffith didn't talk about coal exports. Uh, well, we've been talking about LNG mostly, but it's a broad set of energies that we ought to be exporting from America. Uh, today, with respect to LNG exports, we have a delineation about DOE's authority, whether we're going to transport this to a, uh, a free trade agreement country or a non-free trade agreement country. I guess this is for anyone on the panel. Is there any reason for that demarcation to, to continue to exist? I think it's an artifact. Yeah, that's my sense as well. Uh, I, mean, uh, yeah. I mean, Japan, is, is the example I gave, is not a free trade country, and yet it's an incredibly important country to us. It's a, it's a, it seems to me, too, that there's a history. I've read a little bit of the history of how it came to be, and it seems something that um, we as a policy matter could get rid of. We could direct that those two, uh, those two places for shipment to be treated, uh, treated identically. I, would, I have a view of what DOE's authority ought to be. I don't think the national interest... I think the national interest finding is, uh, uh, by definition... <laughs> It's free trade. It creates wealth in America. I, I think it's by definition, but I'm sure others would uh, have, a, have a slightly different view on that. But at least we could get rid of that, um, that demarcation. Uh, Ms. Ms. Hutzler, uh, I was reading an article about renewable energy, and 
In Eastern Europe, they've subsidized it even longer than we have and even more than we have. Uh, and they have had some uh, power blackouts. There's an article uh, uh, in Bloomberg on October 25th that I'd also like to submit for the record that talks about these energy blackouts. That objection. Uh, you know, our, our grid um, could suffer the same kind of things, in my view, if we have uh, 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 non-storable, <laughs> non-reliable energy source. Do you, have, do you have a view of the risk of us subsidizing this at such a rate that we get to a place where we've got less reliable uh, electricity in America? Yes, uh, Germany is a good example because um, they're phasing out their nuclear units and turning to renewable energy in its place. But obviously, it has to be backed up. And it's caused instability to their grid. Um, neighboring countries are not allowing them to export their renewable energy, their wind energy, to them, such as Poland. And in fact, industrial users are seeing some disruptions in their service that's causing them hundreds of thousands of dollars in equipment. And they've already told the German go government that either you fix this problem or we're going to leave. Excellent. I've got just 20 seconds. Mr. Siminski, you talked about renewables growing at a huge rate. It's easy to grow at a huge rate off a small base. I remember I ran a small company at one point, too. Um, uh, still, still not a, a hugely important part of our energy resource base. When you made these assumptions about its economic growth, what did you assume for federal policy? Did you can, can believe that we would continue our current, uh, somebody on the other side, I called it creative financing. <laughs> I'll call it getting in the pockets of taxpayers. Uh, but <laughs> what, what assumptions did you make about uh, uh, state RPSs and these kinds of uh, uh, non-economic policies remaining in effect supporting these EIA's renewable energy sources. forecasts always use uh, existing law and regulation. We don't try to forecast regulation or law. Um, we do have um, the California renewable um, and, and other laws built into our forecasts. Uh, renewables go from about 13 percent over the last few years to 16 percent of total electricity generation. So there's a lot of growth, but it's still a small, small portion. Great. Thank you. Thank you, panelists, all for being here today. Congressman, I just want to add one other quick thing, if I might, uh, Mr. Chairman. It's okay with me. My time's uh, up. <laughs> <laughs> the, uh, your background in the oil service industry, a uh, number of questions have come up here this morning about uh, the impact of hydraulic fracturing and a need for water. Uh, in Pennsylvania, I know that most of the the flowback water is now being recycled and used again. And uh, changes in technology like um, th the uh, multi-stage fracturing could lead to much less water use simply because the, the identification of where to frack along a horizontal well could cut the uh, number of feet that you have to frack in half. And, uh, all of these things, uh, uh, these changes in technology are taking place at such a rapid pace. It's one of the reasons why EIA's forecasts have, uh, have fallen short, as uh, Mr. Markey suggested. Great. Thank you. Okay. All time has expired, and uh, I want to thank the panel of witnesses. We appreciate very much your... I'm sorry? Yeah, good hearing. So thank you all very much. We'll keep the record open for 10 days, and I'm asking unanimous consent to submit into the record a copy of a statement from the National Petroleum Council and also the executive summary of the uh, IER study on opening federal lands to oil and gas leasing. So with that, uh, we'll conclude today's hearing and once again appreciate the participation of everyone.